So let's see, what's our, do you know what our, uh, if everyone's going to be here tonight? Yes? Yeah, I didn't receive any uh, emails prior to. Yeah, Sean, Sean just called me and he, for some reason, didn't have the sign in, but I just sent it to him and he's signing in right now. So he, he should be here shortly. See his video. He, I didn't, he's I, here. I didn't get the uh, link either until just two seconds, uh, two minutes ago. So I think we're waiting for Commissioner Spellman. And I'll wait another minute or two and then we'll start. Oh, there he is, right. Let me know when you want me to start. Okay, we now have all our commissioners here, so uh, let's there's, start. There's Come one in. that's still connecting to audio. Sean is still connecting to audio, and it might be that he's used the link forwarded from Cindy, is my guess. Um, Sean, can you hear us? Mm -hmm. He can't. Um, so um, I will text. Sarah and let her know that he needs a separate email. Um, looks like Peter's still connecting to audio too. And we are live. We're live? Yes, we are. Okay. Well, we'll just uh, wait a couple of minutes to get two of our commissioners to work their way through the audio requirements. Can we send him a, um, a clipboard? Um, send him a message on the clipboard. Who's who's uh, hosting this? I am. Sarah has sent him another um, the invitation that's specific to him. You can't share your participant ID numbers because, as you can see, he comes up as Commissioner Dawson now. So when he sees that he's got a text with the invite specific to him, he can get out of this and sign back in. And oh, it looks like audio is connected now. Can you hear us, Sean? Maybe not. Can you hear us? Peter, can you hear us? Are you connected? You're muted, but it sounds like you can hear us. But somehow Sean has uh, Commissioner Dawson's ID there. I don't know what's going on. You might need to log out and then log back in with the new link is what I expect. That's correct. Okay, Tess, do you have um, Sean's number at your desk? Yeah. Oh, I think he's okay. Sarah has sent Sean a new link. He is logged off. I'm assuming he's logging back on right now. Okay, well, we'll get going just as soon as uh, Sean comes back.
Can you guys hear me now? Yes. You're, we're all set. Uh, let's have a roll call. Well, I'm gonna, oh, well, I'm going to call the uh, September 16th, 2020 uh, uh, Santa Cruz City Planning Commission to order. Could we please have a roll call? Commissioner Dawson? Here. Conway? Here. Greenberg? Here. Nielsen? Here. Salmon? Here. Maxwell? Here. Chair Schiffrin? Here. Uh, no one's absent. Um, are there any statements of disqualification? Seeing none, we'll turn to oral communications. Um, this is a time for anyone to speak on an item that is not on tonight's agenda for up to three minutes, uh, as long as that item is appropriately before the commission, even though it's not on our agenda tonight. Do we have anybody with their hands up to speak at oral communication? And the commission cannot take action on items that are raised during oral communication. There are no um, attendees currently in the queue. I hope that's not a bad sign. Well, as in the past, given our technology, we may have to come back to oral communications if people are having problems uh, uh, calling in and want to speak to oral communications, we'll um, reconsider that. Let's move on to the approval of the minutes. Uh, does anyone, uh, any of the commissioners have any uh, concerns or changes they would like to make to the minutes? Seeing none, would somebody like to move approval of the minutes December 3rd, 2020? I'll move approval. Is there a second? I'll second. Is there any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any aye. aye. Um, so I abstained since I wasn't uh, at last meet last uh, week's meeting. I can't call it. I can't have a vote that way. I think all our votes have to be by roll call. So could we have a roll call, please, of the uh, um, those voting in favor of the motion, please say aye when your name is called. Commissioner Conway? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Selman? I abstain. I was not uh, present at the meeting. Maxwell? Aye. Chair Schifrin? Aye. Uh, passes unanimously with one abstention. Uh, let's now move to the public hearings. We have item number two. Ordinance Amendment, citywide uh, amendment to the Title 24 of the Municipal Code um, by amending Part 1 of Chapter 2416, Inclusionary Housing Requirements. And I don't think I'm required to read the whole um, section, so I'll just leave it at that and ask for a staff report. Um, Jessica, you need to unmute yourself. You're still muted. So I'm on the phone too, so I'm gonna hang up from the phone. Is that the right thing to do, clerk? No. Oh, so you're not getting a double from me? Not at the moment. All right, great. Okay, I'll start over. Uh, good evening, Chair and Commissioners. Happy to be with you tonight. Um, I'm going to try and share screens here. Give me one second. Can anybody see that? Yes. Excellent. Let me just pop it open to a larger screen if I can. It's loading, hang on. There we go. All right, we're in business. Can everyone see the larger screen? Yeah. 
Excellent. All right. Um, on this slide here, you'll see the staff recommendation for the inclusion, inclusionary ordinance amendment, amendments that are being discussed tonight that would allow rental residential development the ability to make 5% of their required 20% affordable units available to Santa Cruz County Housing Authority tenant-based subsidy holders, and if no such subsidy holder can be found to occupy the unit, that the 5% be restricted to 120% area median income and rent levels in perpetuity. So per council direction, the PC formed a subcommittee uh, earlier this year to focus on the inclusionary ordinance, including the potential for adding a tenant-based subsidy option in the ordinance. The subcommittee includes Commissioner Greenberg, Spellman, and Conway. There have been six meetings to date reviewing various jurisdictions, inclusionary ordinances, and getting feedback from lo local agencies and stakeholder groups. Even though everyone has been impacted by the wildfires, we are still have, we still have a couple meetings left between now and the end of October to wrap up the rest of our work that includes the school district and employee-sponsored housing. For this inclusionary ordinance amendment that we're proposing tonight, we've spent an extensive amount of time working with the housing authority to ensure the process proposed in this amendment would be successful at getting more subsidy holders housed. In addition, we reached out to the development community, as well as local lenders and appraisers on how to solve for the loan underwriting issues that tend to make develop developing new construction uh, less feasible. <laughs> Typically, developers need to apply for loans just like someone going to purchase a home would do. In general terms, lenders will size the loan based on the amount of rental income that, they, that can pay back the loan debt. The lender will take into account higher income deed restrictions to allow for a larger loan. So the 120% income deed restriction on 5% of the inclusionary units helps to make new housing developments more feasible. While the city's main goal is to encourage owners to rent to subsidy holders, the school district has also communicated that they're having trouble attracting and maintaining teachers, and a lot of them are falling under this moderate income level at that 120% AMI level. So as we drafted these proposed amendments, we were trying to solve for a few things, but most importantly, helping tenant-based subsidy holders get housed. So the following few slides provide a summary of the proposed amendments to the ordinance. Uh, Jessica, could I interrupt for a second? Is sure. Hey, your, your screen is showing both the uh, main slide and then the next slide, um, so it's kind of showing your notes, so I, don't, it, I think it would be clearer if you could um, just show the main slide. Yeah, let me see here. How are we doing now? Well, you're back to... Uh, <laughs> Funny Go one more over from where you're at, the little screen there next to the book. Try that. Yeah, that's the one I, the, the slideshow is the one I'm on. Um, I mean, oh, uh, it's trying to load. Resume slideshow. <laughs> uh, hang on. Sorry, I should have kept my mouth shut. No, it's no, not. It's I think it has you don't to have two screens, it's tricky. Yeah, I do have two screens. I think that's what the issue is. Um, hey, t uh, Sarah, have you dealt with this before? I mean, I can um, hey, yeah. Jessica, I think if you, this is Sarah Noisy. Um, this is not who you asked for, but I think if you, up at the top left of the screen, there's a little icon there with a green arrow. Do you see that? It looks like it's next to that. Move your mouse to the right. Looks like a little screen with a green arrow. Can you click share? on that? Uh, sorry, inside of the the at the top left of your screen, yeah, of the, of the PowerPoint slide, the top left. 
Oh, yes. You see that little green arrow? Nope. That one. Try that one. Thank you. Yeah, um, I could put you out of presenter mode and just into the slideshow. And try that resume slideshow. Yeah, it's, I think it's because I have two, two monitors. Um, you might need to, so then I would go into your share screen again. So click again on Zoom and the share screen um, thing at the bottom of your screen. Yeah. And then it gives you, it pops up that window that shows all your different screens. And there should be one that's the view of the slideshow that's just the slideshow in presentation mode and not in presenter mode. Um, let's try stop share. Let's see if I can try this one more time. Um, okay, I oh, know. Let's, uh, I think I might have found it. Hang on here, guys. Better? Yes, there it is. You did it. Very good. <laughs> Thank you, Tara. <laughs> yeah. All right, we are back on track. Um, okay, so following our a summary of the amendments that we are proposing tonight for the inclusionary ordinance, the first one I'm happy to say was actually uh, added post. So we originally had this meeting scheduled for August 20th, but it was canceled due to the wild, wild the emergency wildfires, and so. Chair Schifrin actually provided some feedback on the ordinance amendments, and so we have gone ahead and um, included his uh, one of his uh, comments in this revision. So here, here it is. Um, so adding a definition for sub tenant-based subsidy holder is now part of the proposed ordinance amendments. Um, it's basically just trying to give a very clear explanation of, of who is a tenant-based subsidy holder. Uh, second one, come on. Second one is, um, so I'm looking at two different screens. The second one is basically trying to communicate that there you cannot discriminate between a tenant-based subsidy holder and a non-tenant-based subsidy holder when you're going through the application process. And so everybody's got to be held to the same standard. It's really just reiterating this in our, in our code. And it's trying to load. Can you all see number nine? No, you're still on seven. There we go. Here we are, right. nine now. <laughs> so here is the meat of the ordinance amendment and it basically walks, uh, walks through what we're talking about in terms of a breakdown for this, for this option. Remember, we're talking about an option. So this is not, this doesn't change the entire ordinance. This is merely if somebody decides to, to, to try to use an option, but they can still use the 20% at 80% AMI, or they can look at this alternate means of compliance, which is still a 20% overall total for inclusionary. However, it is 15% at 80% of the area median income and 5% at 120% of the area median income. And that's only if there is no subsidy holders that can be found during a 30-day marketing period. And what happens is the, the developer owner needs to go and sign up on the Housing Authority's website, post this listing, and go through the proper channels to make sure you know, all subsidy holders are aware that this, this property is up, or this unit is up for uh, rent. Um, and again, this is not a one-time thing, so anytime this unit becomes available again, uh, this whole this same process rolls again, where the you got to go back and post it on the housing authority's website and um, uh, try to offer it to a subsidy holder. 
And I know some of the public comments that came in were concerned about, you know, is this the full, that they were worried this wasn't the full 20% being utilized, and it is. In addition, one of the comments that came in was that they were very concerned about the fact that there is such a high need for Section, for section 8, meaning subsidy, tenant-based subsidy holders, um, and we completely agree, and we are trying to figure out a way to incentivize owners to rent to subsidy holders. So th this is kind of the reason why we're, we're trying to, to offer this as an option. Okay, so this follows through more of the process, and again, I want to reiterate that the Housing Authority has walked through this process extensively to make sure it works with how their inner, inner process goes, um, and so we wanted to make sure we have something that's workable and successful. Um, so you can walk through the process here, but, but essentially they will, the owner would have to enter into a payment payment contract for the subsidy rent, as well as uh, there is a monitoring and compliance requirement. So they, the owner needs to provide proof that they did market it for 30 days, they did go through the housing authority process, and they need to keep that proof for five years. All right, so this is looking at another couple ways Again, this, this came from the Housing Authority, and, and it's, it's really focused on trying to incentivize an owner to, to rent the moderate income units to the subsidy holder. And so they, they essentially are almost getting penalized for if they, if they have, if they rented their moderate income units to non-subsidy holders, they, they are essentially getting penalized. So they really, the housing authority is pushing that they want this, the moderate income units to be rented to the, house, the, the subsidy holders. And if the owner has rented all of their moderate income units to subsidy holders and they still have more subsidy holders requesting units, then they can dip into a low income inclusionary unit if one is available. So this is the recommendation again to follow up. I, I know it's a lot of words there, but um, I, I do want to offer up, um, I know some of the subcommittee members may like to provide a few words, so I wanted to offer that up um, before we get to questions. Um, and I think Commissioner Conway, she's chair, chair of the subcommittee, I think she may have a few words. Yeah, thank you. Am I audible? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Jessica, thanks for the report. I know it's been a stressful time to pull these things together. Um, I just wanted to comment that December seems like such a long time ago. Um, but in December, the City Council took action to raise the percentage of affordable units a developer must contribute to the community up to 20%. And they took this action in response to our community's housing sh shortage and our affordability crisis. Um, and it's the crisis that we were dealing with at the start of 2020. And I wanna highlight um, that this crisis has only gotten worse as our community copes with the effects of the multiple disasters that we're facing now. Um, so the council raised the required affordable units to 20% quickly um, and as Jessica said, um, they heard concern from both housing developers in town and also from the school district um, that's been working to provide housing for their employees. Um, and they heard that the change would make it harder or possibly make it impossible to get financing for the housing that they're trying to create. Um, the school district had some additional complexities about their targeting that we're trying to work on now. So the council decided not to conduct um, economic analysis on the impact of the increased percentage. And instead, um, they asked the planning commission to form a subcommittee to make a recommendation that would support the 20% requirement and also um, to further discuss and make a recommendation on employer-sponsored housing um, that would end up working for the school district. 
So tonight's recommendation um, speaks just to the former direction. Um, oh, and I did want to thank the commission for extending um, the subcommittee's term um, to allow us to develop a recommendation for employer-sponsored housing. Um, as you can imagine, responding to you know shelter in place in 2020, um, it's been really difficult to convene. Um, but so this recommendation is meant to tread that middle ground of setting policy that enables housing projects to secure financing so that they will get built, um, and also what, including as many affordable units as is feasible in a project. And so it does this by incentivizing the acceptance by landlords of tenants who receive assistance for the payment of rent. The tenant-based subsidy requirement will also have the benefit of targeting at least 5% of the um, re affordability restricted units to a deeper target of very low and extremely low income households, which is really difficult to do in a um, private um, rental project otherwise. So we've heard from several members of the community supporting the use of tenant-based subsidy. Um, and this is because for some time, it's been really hard to find landlords who were willing to accept subsidy. And this would provide an incentive to do so um, I also want to make the point, though, that the recommendation establishes an alternative in the event a voucher holder is not available. Um, and I know um, a lot of people that that never happens, um, which is which is not true. But in this case, the unit could be rented at a restricted rent. It's affordable to moderate income household, um, and it would then revert to the requirement to rent to a subsidy holder on turnover. So the reason for the fallback is that there are times when landlords are more open to tenants with subsidy because it's a reliable source of income. Um, and um, especially, frankly, in times when, um, when incomes are more questionable. And I know I've watched this um, up and down over the decades that I've been involved in housing. Um, I suspect we may be entering a period now but so by restricting the unit at no more than 120% in any situation, it does provide some certainty to lenders and builders, and it still retains that restriction in perpetuity. So again, we're trying to tread a middle ground here on um, feasibility and maximizing affordability. And um, that's it. I look forward to um, hearing from other committee members and to discussion by the commission, the commission tonight. Thank you very much. Are uh, there, what I propose to do is um, to have the commissioners ask questions um, and then open it up to the public if there's any, from, from anybody from the public who wants to speak and then bring it back to the commission for discussion and action. So do commissioners have questions of staff or the subcommittee? Commissioner Dawson. Yes, I just had a question. Um, I know that you spoke to the Housing Authority um, and Jessica mentioned that you spoke with stakeholders. So what groups did the committee speak to that actually work with subsidy holders uh, like Housing Matters who administers um, some of those vouchers or, or HUD bash in the community who are actually working with voucher holders and kind of know the lay of the land with landlords and availability, were you able to speak to any groups like that? And if so, uh, which ones? Uh, I personally am in, so I run the housing division. I'm working with uh, Sibley Simon's group right now, which is part of Housing Services Matters on their uh, project on Coral Street, their proposed project. And they are looking to use vouchers at their project. Um, several other Developers are looking into whether they have the ability to utilize the Section 8. A lot of them, what happens is there's something called project-based Section 8 versus tenant-based Section 8. And project-based Section 8 actually stays with the development, whereas tenant-based uh, goes with the tenant. So if the tenant leaves, so does the voucher. So the developers obviously would love to have the project-based vouchers, but getting that education on the tenant-based and being able to 
utilize those post construction um, again doesn't necessarily help in terms of trying to get underwriting whereas the project base would um, but it does we are communicating and educating the developers out there to be able to get more of these on the street because there's such a huge wait list for section 8 Other questions? I have a follow-up question, Jessica. Um, my understanding is that a, a fundamental problem with the project-based vouchers is that it's, they're for new construction generally, I guess, maybe for, moder for a major rehab, but they require Davis-Bacon wages. And those are uh, normally much higher than what a developer can get in the market. And that's, a, uh, um, one, a reason why they don't want to do project-based vouchers, and it's also a reason why the proposed ordinance before us tonight, which um, you know makes certain at least five percent of the units being available uh, for Section 8, does provi provide that kind of certainty without the need to get involved with the Davis-Bacon um, requirements. Is that correct? That's correct, and actually, so. The project-based vouchers, most often the affordable housing nonprofit developers really go after those project-based vouchers because they're already doing, they're already required to do state prevailing wage requirements to meet state funding requirements, as well as some of the federal sources that they go after, they would have to do meet that, that federal Davis-Bacon requirement that you're talking about. However, if it is a private developer that is really utilizing only private sources of capital, meaning like a conventional mortgage, possibly some ec investor equity, yes, it's very critical that they do not want to deal with the federal. It just adds a huge cost um, to the project. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> Can we go to uh, see if there are uh, any members of the public who would like to speak to this item? I can hear uh, Tess running across the room. Is that? Can you hear me now? <laughs> if any member of the public wishes to address the uh, commission on this item, please press star nine. Uh, there's one member of the public that has indicated they wish to address the commission. Okay, let's hear from them. Please state your name, and you have three minutes. They've muted themselves. There we go. Hello, speaker, you're Hello? on the line. Hello. Okay, sorry. Yes, um, my name is Candace Brown. I live in Santa Cruz for 45 years. Um, as I listened to this, you know, originally the 20% were excited about because they thought that meant inclusionary at the lower rate, um, which would be um, not at moderate 120, but at 80%. And so my concern is that this change would erode the opportunity to have um, a lower income inclusionary. And um, the other thing which I brought up uh, recently is that by increasing the income of these, um, which will be a, a potentially extensive number of units at this higher rate, um, you're also eroding the tables that are evaluated every year that impact the affordable housing rates, um, and that does have an impact on other affordable housing projects. And it's my understanding there was a letter sent to the Planning Commission recently. For some reason, it didn't get in the packet. Um, and she sent it several times to the Planning Commission. Her mother's in the Riverwalk, and she's explained in great detail um, how this has impacted her mother's ability to potentially uh, stay in an affordable unit. Uh, she's on fixed income, and she's seeing 10 percent increases in 2018 and 2019 with the changes of these, um, these income limits uh, for state programs. So just be aware that anything that you do that increases the um, income level of these units um, especially when you have hundreds of units potentially impacted. And the other thing is that when developers say that, you know, sometimes things don't pencil out, many of the projects recently downtown have been done under non-disclosure. So we really don't know. 
we don't always, even at a city council level, have visibility to, you know, how it pencils out. And so I think that's also worth discussing. So when you do talk to stakeholders, including developers, you know, I think there's a need to be a little bit more transparent about why a project does not actually pencil out. And I would invite the Planning Commission to, you know, to put some language around this to make sure that um, there's full transparency there. Um, the other thing is um, there was a mention that if they couldn't find a moderate, like if they had filled their 5% moderate rate and then somebody comes forward and they want to, they have a tenant bait voucher, they would dip into the lower income. I think I heard that. If that's the case, then you're not only impacting, impacting the 5%, but you're impacting then starting to road into the 15% inclusion area. I would definitely make sure that you put some boundaries around that for sure. So thank you very much uh, for listening. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the public who would like to comment on this item? Um, excuse me, this is the clerk. Any other member of the public, if you would like to address the commission, please press star nine now. Uh, Chair, I don't see any other member of the public that wishes to address the commission. Okay, then I'm going to close the public hearing and bring this back before the commission. Uh, do any commissioners have comments on the item before we go to a vote? Commissioner Dawson. Yes. Um, one, I just would like to um, ask staff. I was also um, um, contacted by a couple members of the public that said their letters didn't get into the packet, and I'm not sure what the process is for that, but I just want to bring that up and ensure that letters being sent in um, are, are indeed in the packet. Um, um, just wanted to put that on the radar screen for staff. Um, specifically to the ordinance before us, I want to thank the subcommittee. This is, uh, as always, complex, a lot of work, a lot of things to balance. And I think overall, um, there was a lot of positive in the ordinance. Um, I would like to bring up that several times um, both committee members in the past and staff have said that um, it was a balancing act, but the key was to incentivize um, uh, providing an opportunity and incentivize uh, property owners to rent to subsidy holders, voucher holders, section, section eight holders. And so um, I, what we're doing now with the proposed language is the opposite of that because you're providing the opportunity for a property owner to choose any reason that they want really um, to not rent to a Section 8 voucher. And I, I just want to share a quick slide with everybody that um, will uh, will demonstrate this uh, via um, via via showing the income levels. Um, and what I really would like everyone to consider is that instead of allowing this to be rented um, to a voucher holder at the housing authority level, and if that is not found, then rented to a moderate level people, that we pin the uh, rent available for that unit as at the housing authority standard. And the reason we would need to do that is so that um, a property owner would actually be incentivized. So just quickly to go through this um, on your screen, I'm going to go to a simpler version in a second. This is all based on um, housing authority numbers. Um, the number you see there, the, or the dark orange bar, is the housing authority payment standard. On the x-axis, the horizontal axis is the size of the unit. You can see that with a rent burden of 35%, um, if you go to the, the blue on the left, that's, that's very low. So that's 50% of AMI. The gray is, is low, 80%. Moderate is the bright orange. You can see that the housing authority payment standard currently comes in between having a rent burden at 35% between very low and low. So if we can just uh, go to the next one here quickly. Um, and what you'll see is that we're not incentivizing renting to a subsidy holder when there's a difference between the moderate income at a 35% um, rent burden 
there's such a huge difference because the property owner, instead of getting, so if we look at a one bedroom, instead of getting a subsidy holder in there for 1844, they could get a moderate income person in there for 2745. And so I think that there's a really easy fix for this that can, can do all the things that we were tasked with doing and that the subcommittee has highlighted. And that would be to pin the maximum rent available for these units, for these 5% of units, if they go this route, that it, it would be pinned to that housing authority payment standard. Um, and I actually, um, I'd love to hear what others have uh, to say, and then um, I perhaps propose some language based on others' input. So I'll stop there for now. And let me stop sharing my screen. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Other commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Conway. Yeah, um, and thank you for that idea and for the chart. Um, I have a similar scratchings on my notes, and it's nice to see it presented graphically. Um, there's a lot of things about that idea that I really like. I think in practicality it doesn't work because um, the payment standard is something that is taken on, as Chair Schifrin can attest, it is a major effort every year um, to uh, conduct a study that backs up a payment standard that, um, it, it, that exceeds HUD's published fair market rent. Um, that, and it's not something that is always done. Um, and the thing that we know over time is that both the fair market rent and the payment standard and if you want, I can explain the relationship between those in case people don't know what those two different terms mean. Um, but while, while this is true now, um, in many years, it is not going to be true and it won't be predictable. Um, and what we were trying to do is um, retain that, you know, uh, that deed restriction in perpetuity that that is a designated affordable unit while still providing um, some, uh, some sense that, the, that an underwriter could predict what the rent will be. Um, so I love the idea. I don't think it works um, uh, to meet the standard that we're trying to do. And I mean, I thought about a lot about it too. Um, because as you said, you look at the difference between the current, pay well, current fair market rent the current payment standard, the 120% affordability, and then market, which is going to, you know, bounce around based on circumstances. Um, and um, it is the challenge is, um, is that what we're trying to do is to provide that um, underwriting criteria that will allow a lender um, to fund a project. I wonder if I could respond. That's my thought. Um, the difference between fair market rent and payment standards is, is in fact, very confusing. Um, every year, HUD sets a fair market rent um, based supposedly on some God knows what process they go through. They do allow the housing authority, and our housing authority has been very uh, um, assertive in carrying out the studies that have shown that fair market rents that HUD has come up with supposedly based on rent levels in the community are really off. And the HUD has accepted these studies and increased the fair market rents significantly. Now, the, the payment standards are, a way, are related to the fair market rents um, based on how much money the housing authority gets overall what subsidies each of its voucher holders need, and it may be somewhat less than the, um, uh, than the fair market rent. It could go over the fair, I don't know if it can go over the fair market rent, may be able to, but it's a way of, that, uh, of the, the authority determining this is what we, we're gonna set our rent, uh, our, our rents on, on a usual basis. Now, somebody can come in and have a particular situation and they may, um, they may allow something more. But to respond to Commissioner Conway directly, each year the fair market rent changes. 
each year the moderate income, uh, the median income percentages changes. So it's not surprising that the fair market, the, the payment standard is going to change because it's somewhat related to that. Um, I agree with um, the position that um, Commissioner Dawson is saying in terms of the, um, the incent not wanting to provide an incentive to have higher rents. But I want to raise another concern because I went to the municipal code, um, uh, the, the inclusionary ordinance, and what became clear is that we have, there's a distinction between who's the tenant, who can be a tenant in these units, and what is going to be the rent level. And what the ordinance says is that if, if a subsidy holder can't be found, then the tenant can have, can be a, mod, can have an, a moderate income, can be of moderate income. The household can be a moderate income. The, the, and that's 120 percent. That income is 120 percent of the uh, AMI. However, when you go to the ordinance that defines what the uh, rent levels are supposed to be, there's a section in the inclusionary 2416015 definition, and there's a definition of affordable rent. That definition has the affordable rent for low-income households, very low-income households, and extremely low-income households. It doesn't define what the affordable rent would be for moderate-income households. And the reason is that when the ordinance was first written, there was the expectation that rental units would be for low- and very low-income people, and ownership units would be for moderate-income people. So the moderate-income uh, ownership units has, you know, what moderate-income people would pay for a unit. There is no um, affordable income um, rent level for um, moderate income households. So that's another reason why I think it makes sense to use the payment standards. And I, and I would want, I want to suggest, I think it would be very easy for the ordinance to allow that. And I want to sort of just um, cite the uh, proposed ordinance where in section 9A, Owners of rental housing uh, developments or single room may elect to have the following provision, and if they can't rent to the, uh, to the subsidy holder, 5% uh, of the total units in a project will be restricted to moderate income at an affordable rent, and then I would add the language based on the County of Santa Cruz Housing Authority payment standard, because that's what would determine what the rent is. Otherwise, there's nothing in the ordinance that defines what that rent should be. And I think that um, that's, doesn't make sense. Um, then in C2, a deed restricted rent no greater than the County of Housing, uh, County of Santa Cruz Housing Authority payment standard, affordable to income qualifying moderate income households if no other eligible uh, subsidy holder applied to rent. So I think, you know, I think it makes sense both in terms of uh, not providing a, uh, an incentive to owners to uh, reject subsidy holders. Um, it, it still makes the units available for people with incomes up to the moderate income level. So it still uh, pro could provide for moderate uh, income households to rent these units. It just says that those units should be rented at no more than the payment standard. So I, I, I think that makes sense. It's consistent with the, um, with the, it's not inconsistent with anything that's currently in the ordinance and it sort of clarifies what it means to rent a affordable unit to a moderate income household. If I don't know if staff has a response to that. Um, there's, you know, my sense is this is not, this does not change philosophically at all what the intention was uh, as it was outlined by staff and the subcommittee. This is what we want to achieve. We want to have units that are available to subsidy holders. If they can't be, uh, uh, if the subsidy holders can't be found, then they can be available to moderate income households, but the maximum rent should not provide an incentive to uh, owners to not rent to subsidy holders. 
So let me ask staff and then Commissioner Greenberg had a comment and then I don't know, is your hand up Commissioner Conway? You know, it wasn't, but yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, I have another comment. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm sort of reiterating a little bit what, what's already been said, and part of this is we were trying to solve for multiple issues, and one of them is trying to get more housing built in the city. Um, and so trying to solve for that feasibility issue and a lender and an appraiser that is doing the underwriting for the lender will tell you that they're going to look for, they're going to look for some kind of consistency and, and I'm guessing a lot of these appraisers, knowing the payment standard changes fluctuates quite a bit, that there's a, a lack of consistency there. So again, I think that's gonna take the, the, the ability to size that loan larger so that you know, a development can get built. Um, that's one issue. I guess another one, another angle I would probably look at is I think what we're trying, I mean, what the Housing Authority has said and what most people, even in the public comments, have said is the wait list for Section 8 is enormous. It's years of waiting. Uh, you know, how can we get the, that wait list, how can we get people off that wait list and get people housed off of Section 8? That's, what, that's really what we're trying to do here. And so I would almost try to look at if there's some other way. And I know you did, you did try to look at this, Chair, with some of the comments that you sent to us, but you know, there's sort of a law, there's a potential for a lawsuit issue with some of the language that was proposed. But if there is a way to, uh, you know, if everyone is agreeing that the Section 8 wait list is so large, how could we not be able to get these Section 8 folks housed? Um, I, you know, how, how would this all of a sudden switch to 120% AMI uh, level unit? That's, I guess, what I would question. Well, let me respond directly to that because I think there's a fundamental confusion confusion between the wait list and the vouchers available. The wait list is very long because the housing authority has a limited number of Section 8 vouchers that have been allocated to it. Um, as I understand it at the current time, while the wait list might have thousands of people who would like to have a voucher, there maybe are uh, almost 5,000 vouchers um, that the housing authority, and as I understand it, there are probably about 200 at any time where mm -hmm. people are out there looking for housing. So it's not like everybody in the, on the wait list can go out there and find a unit. It, they have to, you know, the housing authority has to have the vouchers available so that they can give it to, you know, they can uh, give them to people. And, you know, it's sometimes it's easier for um, um, voucher holders to find units. At other times, it's really hard for them to find uh, units. Um, and so, but I think it's important to remember that because the wait list is huge, doesn't mean that there are lots and lots of people out there looking for units. Let me also respond to what you said about the, that the payment standard changes. It doesn't change any more frequently than the fair market rents or the median income. Those are changed every year, and the housing authority adopts a payment standard every year, and that's what they use over the year. Um, and so it's not any different than if somebody was, if, if there was, if it was based on like low income, 30% uh, of the low income, that changes every year because the median income is going to change any, every year. So 30% is going to change. I think what it really, what, what the real benefit of having it is one, it puts it in the ordinance, but two, it prevents a, um, a, an owner assuming that there'd be a, another rental level that the, that the city would have to define um, from wanting to uh, uh, not rent to subsidy holders because they could get a higher rental level if they didn't rent to subsidy holders. With this, with using the payment standard, that gives the lender a, a fixed amount. It's going to be the payment standard, whether it's a subsidy holder or a non-subsidy holder, and they're going to know what that is. It is set, um, and so it's just as set as what, whatever uh, median income would give you. So I, I don't think it really cre creates any additional problems. 
Uh, but Commissioner Greenberg, did you want to say something? And then Commissioner Conway. Um, yeah, so thanks. thanks everyone for your really thoughtful feedback on this. Um, and this has been, uh, you know, a, a process of trying to figure out the best way to frame this policy. And this is not something that uh, I had considered this issue that Chair Schifrin is raising in response to Commissioner uh, Dawson about the fact that, uh, you know, there, that in the ordinance itself, the, you know, the fact that moderate income is not defined in terms of actual rents. Um, so we're looking at a tenant rather than, you know, a dollar amount for a rent. And I think that's a significant, you know, issue when we're calling something moderate income, but it could really mean any level of rent. So someone could be 120% AMI, but they could be paying 90% of their income conceivably on a rent that could be set. Um, and so what we want is a moderate income person who's, who's paying, and perhaps this is what the payment standards has to do with, you know, something like, you know, more close to 30% of their income on rent. And uh, so I'm concerned that we would indeed, without stipulating a rent level, be incentivizing people to, and especially since, let's say there are 200 voucher holders out there, if they don't find a voucher holder who happens to be um, available in that 30-day window, that they could then go to moderate income, that would be essentially going, you know, beyond what many moderate income people could really afford, um, but would be kind of forced to pay. And so it wouldn't be fundamentally affordable in that sense. Um, and in that sense would be undermining, you know, the, the inclusionary ordinance. So I'm concerned about that. And I, um, I also hear the concern about underwriting which is another motivation here, um, and predictability. And um, I also agree. I mean, I just was reading, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, that fair market rents have gone up from one year to the next by 20%. Um, so, you know, we're seeing enormous fluctuation in AMI, in fair market rents. And I would imagine that, you know, lenders are dealing with markets like this throughout California and around the country. And this would be, um, you know, another figure that they would know is being set annually and that they are going to have to accommodate to. It just means that it's not going to allow for so much upward variability. It's going to be fixed at a lower level. And it's going to be similar to what a voucher holder would be paying, whether they find one or not. So um, I am very persuaded by what... Commissioner Dawson and Chair Schiffer are saying, and I really appreciate the research and thoughts that you've put into this. And I understand that we're trying to balance these things um, on the subcommittee, and I think this is actually a, a good way to do it. So, thank you. Commissioner Conway, you're next. Yeah. Um, I wanted to make a, a couple of points. Um, and again, I, um, well, there, and there's a couple of things, and I don't think we should go down in the weeds about how fair market rent changes and how AMI changes. There was a huge uh, jump between 2018 and 2019, and a lot of that had to do with that it was flat for I think it was six years, um, which you know caused that big jump. Um, so it's a, it's a little bit. I just want to disaggregate that that issue. Um, a little bit, but the the big question that that we're trying to solve for, uh, one of the issues that we're trying to solve for, in the first place, was treating this five percent of the additional deed restriction differently. Um, is we are trying to ensure that projects get built, and we're trying to do that in a way that kind of again walks that middle ground. Is 20% inc inclusionary requirement the right number? Is that the number that is going to get the community what it needs in terms of additional restricted units and still get projects built? 
And one of the problems with this, as you know, as you recall, um, I have is that this was not studied. We basically just don't know. Is 20%, is that additional 5% going to be enough of a disincentive to builders that they won't build? Um, and we're trying to mitigate to soften the impact of that unstudied increase by saying, okay, you can go up and by, by my figures, I came up with an 80% rent of, um, for a two bedroom. We always use a number of bedrooms plus one when calculating this. I came up with um, 1,980 for a restricted rent for an 80% household. The payment standard for that same household would be 2434. So it's a bump, um, and it would um, provide some, uh, it, it may mitigate the impact, the unknown impact of that additional 5%, um, whereas a 120% rent for that household would be 2970. So in other words, it goes up as a jump of, you know, around 450, a little under $500 per month for each of those. And um, the answer to um, the impact on developers and onto building, because after all, what we're really trying to do here is build housing, is that we don't know. Um, and I like the idea of, I especially like the idea of making it really clear that um, it is um, landlords cannot discriminate against a household based on the source of, of their funds to pay rent. Um, and I think it's really good for the city to um, be really clear about that illegal discrimination, um, but to, to highlight that. And I personally don't think that, um, you know, I don't think landlords will. I think that this is, you know, highly visible. Um, and I'm not sure that I, that I do buy that, you know, that middle, middle ground. Does it, does it soften the impact enough? It's hard to say because we never studied it in the first place. Um, so I, I guess I'd have to say I'm not sure. Um, I like the idea of having it an apples for apples. You can take that tenant um, paying cash out of pocket or you can take that tenant um, who can be an income up to 120%, um, but they will be, pay, you know, uh, paying with their own funds um, as opposed to the rental subsidy. I like the idea of it being even, but I'm not sure it meets the goals um, of what we were looking for. I'd like to hear more discussion. Uh, Commissioner Dawson? Yeah, thanks everybody for the really thoughtful comments. Um, I, I just had uh, a couple things. So. One, um, I actually live in a household with somebody who works with voucher holders, and it is well over 200 folks on the street looking for units. Um, and there is data from other places that, it, that landlords do discriminate against voucher holders, mm -hmm. and there is lots of anecdotal evidence from people who work with voucher holders here in town that that is also an issue. So I just want to be really clear that um, we have some pretty good evidence that that is an issue. And so that is one of the things that we were tasked with addressing. And I just want to go back to what, what um, the task was as, as I understand it, um, going back and reading and kind of doing my homework on this is that, um, you know, that we weren't tasked to um, determine whether the 20% is good for Santa Cruz or not. What we were tasked with specifically is to find a way to incentivize landlords to, to house voucher holders. So we know that there are 200 plus folks on the street with a voucher looking for a unit. And so trying to figure out a way to balance all the very difficult things that you have all brought up, I think is the key goal. So I think that's really important. And, um, Commissioner Conway just brought up that we don't know the impact. So saying we're mitigating for an impact kind of uh, is putting the cart before the horse because we don't know if there's an impact. Um, and so I think we should be careful about the language we use about whether this meets 
what what we're tr what we were tasked with achieving. Um, I actually have, and, and I would just like to push a little bit on this idea of that um, Commissioner Schifrin brought up about that. You know, when the exclusionary was envisioned originally, the fact that there isn't even a definition for moderate income should give us some kind of clear indication what the intent was. And intent, I think, really matters. And so I actually would propose that um, we that, that we set at the housing authority standard and then that be available to a low income resident. So because a low income resident could pay for that if you go back to the chart. And um, I would, um, I know we're going to have some more discussion, but again, I have some specific language around that, but I really think if we're trying to meet the intent of the inclusionary ordinance and the task that we were given, that we can do better here and that we can set the, the floor at the housing authority uh, standard, just like Commissioner Conway said, apples to apples. So we truly are incentivizing housing these subsidy holders, which is guaranteed, right? That for a landlord, they know they're getting that money. So it really um, puts those subsidy holders in a good position to get housed. Um, and then if they can't, then we make that available to a low income um, resident, which could pay that rent out of their own pocket with a reasonable rent burden. So that's what I would like to see. And I'll stop there. Um, Here, can I make a quick clarifying point, and then I'd like to hear what others say, too, um, okay. about it is true that 40 years ago um, it was envisioned that the restricted targeted housing would go to moderate income households as ownership units. And 40 years ago, um, we did not envision the housing market we deal with today. We certainly didn't deal, um, anticipate the really dire shortage of rental housing and the number of households at much higher incomes that for whom ownership is completely out of reach. And it is a very small matter to define what affordability means at moderate income. We could easily just use the redevelopment um, definition for that. And it, it would, that would be an easier definition to insert um, than what we're saying about the payment standard. Although again, I'm not saying against it. I'm against it. I'm just not convinced. I want to hear more discussion. Could I ask you a question um, in terms of where you came up with your rent, your proposed rent levels? Um, you said that a moderate income rent would be $2,900. What was that based on? What percentage so, of moderate income, um, media, uh, moderate income was, was that a, a function of? So um, I just use a very standard, um, uh, so we, we took, as you always do, um, or as programs do, they assume the household size is the number of bedrooms plus one. And I just calculated at the current three bedroom, 120% AMI, assuming a 30% housing cost. Okay, so you assume 30%. Where in the ordinance does it say that that would be the standard? It could be. Uh, four, so I. It could be uh, twenty. I mean, there's nothing in. That, that's why I think we have a practical problem, mm -hmm. as well as a philosophical problem. Um, and uh, I agree with you philosophically um, that it's reasonable to make these units available when they can't go to subsidy holders to moderate income households. Um, I do think, though, that uh, that the sta the payment standard, the rent maximum should be the same whether it's a subsidy holder or not, so that there aren't incentives to uh, not take Section 8 holders. Uh, and I think this is it, it's particularly true because we don't have anything in the ordinance now that really sets a moderate income rental level. And so it's, you know, that becomes a, you know, that, that becomes a separate, a whole separate issue. Um, it would that, be easy to add, however, right. Well, if we could agree on it, I mean, it would be easy to add the payment standard, but, um, you know, that, I think that, to my mind, that deals with the problem of um, disincentivizing the, um, the notion of um, 
not not renting to disincentivizing not renting to the Section 8 voucher holders. But let's hear from other commissioners if they want to, you know, wade into this, uh, wade into the weeds here. Does anybody else have something that they'd like to add? Commissioner Spellman. Yeah, I don't. I don't have a lot to add. I think uh, this discussion is really honing in on the sticky points of of what we've proposed here. Um, I hear a lot of words about incentivizing, you know, developers, and I'm. I think that's a little bit disingenuous on what the what the task at hand is about. I think on the face of it, you can't deny that the approach was you know, to create an incentive, right, in, in the grand scheme of it. Um, I think what we were trying to do was, how do you do that, but then still protect the affordability level? And we, we settled on the 120%. I think there is room for discussion around that. I don't know enough, quite frankly, to say the housing authority, you know, threshold is a better number. I think there's a there's a perceived um, component to that idea that sends a message to the community that that unit and that rent will always be at a certain level. And I think there's, you know, current traction and resonance around that point, which, you know, I think has, uh, you know, some very good, good uh, thought around it. So I'm, um, I'm, um, open to that that concept of trying to figure out what the right number is and find ways to protect the fact that you know the small amount of affordable units we have really uh, stay that way from the public's perception. Thank you. Anyone? Any other commissioners want to um, make a statement about this? Uh, Commissioner Maxwell, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> um, I'm I'm just gonna pretty much piggyback uh, what Commissioner Spellman said. I think uh, it is, you know, just about the sticky points. Um, I definitely think our job here is uh, to find that middle ground to where we can build, where we incentivize the developers, but at the same time, we need to, you know, create affordable housing that is predictable in some way. I mean, even though we're dealing with the changing, everything's going to, you know, things will change as the future goes forward. Um, but I think the main point, again, I think I agree with Commissioner Dawson and Chair Schifrin, uh, definitely incentivizing, disincentivizing the landlords to choose non-subsidy holders over the median income, you know, the 120%. Is kind of a big deal, um, and I would love to. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm leaning more towards that. I'm open to what other commissioners say as well. That's that's what I have to say. Uh, Commissioner Nielsen. Um, so, I, from from my perspective, I question um, making a change to what the subcommittee has spent a lot of time discussing and going through, talking with stakeholders, developers, and um, HUD, and, and I know that staff spent a lot of time on this. So um, I guess I have a concern with, with just making a change and, um, and just going with that. Um, so I'm wondering, is there, um, with, with this change coming forward, is there um, a possibility of continuing the discussion through the subcommittee to figure out if that is really the right way to go? Um, because I think we're all, um, I mean, based on kind of this discussion, I think there's, uh, there's not full consensus. Um, people, I mean, everybody is thinking that maybe, you know, there, there could be, this may work or may not work, but I think I would prefer that that be researched and really discussed um, in maybe within that subcommittee um, environment so that that can really be evaluated. Um, and then we can, as a commission, look at it again, um, you know, through that, you know, with, a, with maybe some new writing on that. 
Okay, uh, uh, Jessica, did you want, you had your hand up first and then Commissioner Greenberg. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to uh, thank everyone for the really great comments. This is an excellent discussion we're having and I do appreciate the fact that we're thinking long and hard about this and I do think it should go back to the subcommittee to, to take a deeper dive um, and come back with, with uh, you know, be back at another meeting. Um, and I do want to possibly look at, again, Chair, I know you brought this up in your comments a few weeks ago, is, is there a way to strengthen uh, the ability that a owner landlord cannot not rent to a Section 8 if it's available? You know, I, I, it's just a question, we just, it's a dance between, uh, you know, discrimination, lawsuits, all that stuff. So I, it's, we definitely need to bring counsel in for that. But, um, you know, I agree with everybody here. We really want the Section 8 to, to be, you know, to be rented. So um, if we could continue the item, that would be, um, that would be great. Commissioner Greenberg. Um, I'm open to, to what folks um, think about that. Um, I really also appreciate this conversation and I um, I think that I hadn't understood quite honestly that this 120 percent moderate income was not pegged to a rent and I should have known that and so I really appreciate um, this being brought to us um, and I think it really does meet this double kind of this balancing act of both predictability on one hand and um, you know, uh, the inclusionary ordinance on the other and providing for affordability at multiple levels. So um, I don't know if that's the uh, payment standard. Um, Commissioner Conway brought up um, a redevelopment authority um, figure, which I'm not um, familiar with, but like how that might be calculated. Um, but um, I do think that having that Kind of add insofar as we're kind of adding this to the original uh, inclusionary ordinance, like having that stipulated um, as the as the original ordinance did for for lower income folks, would be really um, an important responsibility for us and what I think the public would expect from from this um, change. So thank you. Well, let me just say that on the one hand. Um, I think the committee and the staff have done an incredible job here. They've dealt with all the issues that I could come up with around trying to um, assure that the housing units would go to subsidy holders. It's a very, uh, well, I think, well-crafted ordinance. Could it be stronger? Sure. I suggested some stronger language and was said, well, what did we want to get involved in lawsuits? And it was like this was considered and maybe that wasn't such a great idea. It's already pretty strong language and there has to be accountability to the housing authority and to the city. Uh, so I think that the ordinance is very strong. What we're, you know, the only thing that's really lacking is what will be the rent level for a moderate income, um, for a moderate income household. And I think uh, the, the, the argument will come down to do we use a payment standard that's consistent for uh, the same as for the subsidy holders to provide uh, uh, an, an incentive to choose the subsidy holder, or do we come up with some other percentage um, that would be added into the ordinance? And it could go back to the subcommittee and then come back to us and we can have the same argument all over again. But on the other hand, the council approved the 20% uh, many months ago. And one of the, the objections to them ap approving it is that it really was going to provide a, a burden, a, a put a burden on developers. And that's why it was important to get this uh, moving on this Section 8 option as a way of providing greater cer certainty to developers as they try to uh, finance their projects. And so I'm a little re reluctant to send it. I think the choices are clear. Um, the, you know, it's, I'm not sure it's really worth um, sending it back, taking more time, more meetings to, um, to, to discuss this. Um, so, I mean, I'll, I think it's time for somebody to make a motion and we'll see where 
the commission is, and if there's uh, the votes to move forward, I think that would be my preference. If a majority of the commission wants to send it back to the subcommittee, that's fine. But I, uh, I think we've had a really um, useful and in-depth discussion tonight, so I, I'm not sure I see what more could come out, come out of it. Uh, Commissioner Dawson. Yeah, um, I again thank you everybody for the conversation. But I would like to move um, an amended version of the um, of the ordinance uh, for consideration by the commissioners. And uh, let me bring up that language uh, right now. Um, so uh, let, I'll just go to the meat of it. Um, so. The, the I also personally have um, uh, just maybe an aesthetic problem with calling these moderate income units because if we're trying to send them to to um, subsidy holders, it kind of presupposes by calling them moderate income units. So I would actually like to um, call these payment standard units. Um, and then um, there's Chair Schifrin's uh, language in there about unreasonably denying the occupancy. Um, and then uh, this is getting down uh, into so the part that's kind of the, the meat of this is subsidy holders. Um, so it would be, let's see, the developer affordable housing agreement as defined uh, require that 15% of the total units be developed. Uh, affordable and that 5% of the total units in the project will be restricted to be rented to subsidy holders or rented um, and I'm fine to put moderate income non subsidy holders but if we do that we're going to have to also move forward some language to define that um, and pretty much that it just cascades through the ordinance um, that the holders at the current housing authority payment standard. And that's really the key change. Just as Chair Schifrin said, it's, it's not a lot of change. Um, it's just about using that payment standard. And again, I would just say that I believe that if there is any, regardless of what we define, if there is the opportunity to rent this unit to a higher rent level, regardless of what we define it, that is above the payment standard, um, property owners will find a reason to do that. And that's why I would like to move this forward for consideration. Well, let me clarify what your motion is because you, you seem to indicate a number of changes. One was uh, to add language about unreasonably denying occupancy. Another was to insert, to change, uh, will you, uh, is part of your motion to change moderate income to non-subsidy holders? Um, that wasn't clear. So is that what your, uh, I'm not clear what your motion is. And you also said you had mixed feelings about calling it moderate income or not. So. Uh, I can walk through. So one, I'd just like to set the definition of a, what a subsidy holder is, um, what a payment standard unit is, and what a low income non-subsidy holder is. Um, I think I would be willing, uh, based on the um, comments from the commissioners, to just make that a non-subsidy holder um, that uh, could be low or moderate income. So tenant that can provide proof of income that meets the definition of uh, lo low or moderate. Okay, so those definitions would then cascade through the ordinance. So my changes are in red. So the first one is unreasonably denying. The next one is under the first section, um, rental to tenant based subsidy holders with the possibility to rent to non subsidy holder tenant at the housing authority payment standard. Um, and then again, uh, to the section about the 5% rented to subsidy holders or rented, um, that should be low or moderate, income non-subsidy holders at the current housing authority payment standard. 
Um, the units that are used to comply with the impunity ordinance requirement shall re uh, remain affordable into perpetuity. Um, again, this is just saying that, that that cap for the unit is the payment standard, should be housing authority um, payment standard. Okay, is that your motion? It is. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second the motion. Okay, um, there's a motion and a second. Um, oh, Chair Schiffern, I'm sorry, there's one more substantive part of this motion that uh, we may need to redo that first and second. Um, there, there's also a section about um, a status report on the implementation, implementation of this option um, so that we can actually evaluate how this is working and if it needs to be changed in the future. And the language is up on the screen. Is that acceptable to the second? Yes. Okay, there's a motion and a second on the floor. Um, I'm not gonna support the motion. And it's not that I sort of I disagree with the substance of it so much as I think the the ordinance that came to us is very complete. And if we are gonna make any changes to it, there's only one change that I think is legitimate at this time, and that is to set the rent levels for a moderate income. And it's very simple to do that um, by just adding some language to 9A and 9C2 uh, that says that ties the affordable rent to the payment to the housing authority payment standards. And I think, from my mind, just making those minor changes would uh, would be sufficient. So I think. All the other, um, <clears throat> the other changes just make the uh, ordinance more complicated, and um, I don't I don't feel I'm, I'm willing to support that at this time. Other comments from other commissioners, Commissioner Conway. Yeah, I want to thank Commissioner Dawson for her effort to try to craft some language. Um, and I would um, love to put this issue aside, actually. I think we've worked pretty hard on it. Um, but I, um, and I also would like to say I really support the language about unreasonably denying occupancy to a subsidy holder. I think that's a really positive ad um, that we should keep um, at any rate. But I, um, as much as I'd like to be done with this portion of the subcommittee's effort tonight, I feel like this is ordinance language and doing it piecemeal and without study ends up with muddled ordinances. Um, it's hard enough to craft them as it is. Um, if there's an interest in, in doing this, um, I guess I feel like I think it should go back to the subcommittee um, one more time to craft with staff and come back with a new recommendation um, that, that um, meets um, some additional goals. And I also, again, would just like to ask the question about, I've, I've been hearing that, what does moderate income mean? And it is it has a very precise definition. Um, I agree that the ordinance isn't pointing to it adequately to define affordability and maybe define it enough, but it's not like we would make up out of thin air what it is. And either we mean um, that the alternative to a tenant-based subsidy holder is moderate income, which means one thing, or it's a payment standard. They aren't the same thing. So I just feel like it's a little too muddled to move on it um, on this proposal, and I also won't support it, despite liking some aspects of it. Other commissioners? Okay, let's uh, have a roll call vote, please, on the motion and a second. The motion is the um, proposed changes by Commissioner Dawson. Commissioner Conway? No. Dawson? Aye. Greenberg? Uh, no. Uh, Nielsen? No. 
Bellman? No. Maxwell? Aye. Schifrin? No. The motion fails on a five to two vote. Um, there, I, I, before somebody else makes a motion, I would like to say that there is a real difference between and what is a moderate income, which I think there is no question about that. That's 120 percent of the median. And what uh, what should be an appropriate moderate income rent in an affordable unit? And um, that's you know, what I think we could decide tonight or um, what I'm hearing from a couple of commissioners is that they want more time to uh, chew on it. Uh, and so I'm waiting for another motion. Is there another motion that somebody would like to make? Commissioner Nielsen? I would like to uh, make a motion that um, this issue go back to the subcommittee. Is there a second to the motion? Yes, I second that. Um, I'm reluctant to send it back. Let me ask the chair of the subcommittee whether um, it would make sense to put a return date. I mean, we waited six months for this uh, ordinance to first come. Uh, I really hope that doesn't happen again. So um, I would uh, urge the, the maker of the motion and the second to uh, uh, give us a, uh, a, a specific return date so we know it's going to come back. Uh, Commissioner Conway. Well, I would like to say that the uh, term it took to get back here really was, you must acknowledge, pretty far beyond our control. Um, we <laughs> met a bunch of times thinking we were going to get come back as soon as possible um, in late March or early April. So pinning that delay on the subcommittee feels just a little unfair. I do think that what I would propose is I would love to bring it back and clear the decks. We've got plenty of work to do on um, coming up with a definition and use for employer-sponsored housing. Um, I would propose that the subcommittee take care of this as soon as possible. I don't want an immediate date because I think that that jams up when staff reports are due and can really uh, prevent the best quality staff work on the follow-up. Um, I do know that we'll be bringing this back as soon as possible. Nobody wants it to linger. Um, and I believe our charge is to be done by the end of October at any rate. Uh, the planning director is now looking at us, and I thought I saw his hand up or some uh, a facsimile of that. Did you have anything that you wanted to say? Yes, thank you, Chair Schifrin. Um, I was just going to suggest that um, if you do set a date um, uh, for returning, that um, would mean that we don't need to go through the cost associated with noticing again. If it isn't ready on that date, we could continue it again. Um, but um, looking, at, looking at your upcoming calendar, um, you have a meeting on, for example, um, October um, 15th, which is about a month from now. And so um, that could allow for some time for meeting and then um, wouldn't mean that we have to re-notice. And if it isn't ready, we could continue it at that time. Um, but it would uh, save us a little bit of cost in terms of the noticing. Is it acceptable to- Certainly in favor of that. Second of the motion to have a return date of October 15th? I'm fine with adding that to the motion. Okay? Yeah, and I second that as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any other comments? Uh, Commissioner Greenberg. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that I'm hopeful that this can be a pretty um, focused discussion that we can have on the subcommittee, really just around this issue of not only stipulating the type of household, but the rent level um, within this amendment to the ordinance. So. Um, so I'm hopeful that that can be uh, something we can do alongside of our other our other tasks. And uh, you know, I don't know if there's we can we can speak uh, as a subcommittee about when we can ways we can discuss this to expedite the process. You know, perhaps there's there's other ways we can also meet to to facilitate that decision making around that. 
Okay, thank you. Is there any other discussion on the motion to continue this item until our second meeting in October? If not, let's have a roll call vote. Commissioner Conway? Aye. Johnson? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Selman? Aye. Maxwell? Aye. Chair Schiffman? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, we'll now move on to our second item on the agenda, which is, uh, what is it? The parking regulations. So could we have a staff report, please? Yes, hi, good evening. Sarah Noisy with the advanced planning section. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. I know it's getting late and I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge um, that we are all here and I really appreciate the effort that you folks are volunteering for your community tonight in some, you know, what are really trying times. So I understand all of us are overextended and I really appreciate your time and care on these ordinances. Um, because these next two are, while important, rather dry. So um, let's talk about parking. I wanted to just start by reading you just a couple sentences from this wonderful book called, that you can't see the cover of because of my virtual background, called Parking Reform Made Easy from the introduction. It says, I think this just kind of sets up our conversation really well. Parking requirements stand in the way of making cities livable, equitable, and sustainable. This is because parking is a prodigious and inefficient consumer of land. If parking was a person, we might say that he, she is very poor at multitasking. Parking serves one type of transportation, the private vehicle, and uses more land or building area per trip served than any other travel mode. Weekly farmers markets notwithstanding, parking is rarely used for any other purpose. So um, I will go ahead and share my screen here. Um, so, oops, share. So we're going to be talking about um, the proposed parking regulations that were included, um, changes to the parking regulations that were included with your packet. Goodness gracious! For the most part, she was. For the most part, um, these the changes that we're making tonight come from existing city policy documents. They come from policies that are in the general plan, um, work that was done on the housing blueprint by the housing blueprint subcommittee last year, um, and also from the climate action plan. The policies in those documents also go further than what we are proposing tonight. So we're taking kind of an incremental step towards implementing some of these policies. Um, and we acknowledge that there is a lot more work to be done on parking uh, in the city of Santa Cruz. We're also incorporating some feedback that we hear um, from applicants and other users of our code. So we've done a couple of things to just kind of improve the usability and readability of our code with, um, with these ordinance amendments. The goals that we had were, um, you know, guided by the policy in these, uh, in these sort of policy documents. We wanna provide options for meeting the parking requirements. And then overall, we do have a goal to reduce those requirements as they burden the production of new housing and um, opening of new businesses. So I'm gonna go through these, these uh, the proposals kind of by topic. Um, and it's my recommendation that we kind of discuss them by topic. If there's another way that you'd like to go through the ordinance, of course, I'm, I'm open to however is um, sort of easiest to, to discuss it. So we made some changes to um, the electrical electric vehicle parking standards and accessible parking standards because those are required by the California Building Code. Um, we had a prior reference in the code, so we just, updated it and continue to reference that in our zoning ordinance. We also um, did a couple of different actions that sort of consolidated and clarified some existing standards that were previously spread throughout the code. We brought them all together. So for example, there were standards that we used for driveways and they were in like three or four different sections. So we brought them all together so they were in one section. So you can find all the standards for driveways in one convenient location when you're building your next driveway. Um, we added some cross-references specifically to um, sections of the code that deal with um, clear vision areas, clear corner triangles, vegetation in those areas where um, cars are entering and exiting properties. Um, and we also added a couple of references to the downtown parking 
uh, resolution because that does sort of regulate the parking standards that are in, in our downtown parking district. Uh, we're also, we also updated some of our commercial uses to reflect modern uses. We kind of consolidated all of those um, uses that are about community care facilities. So assisted living facilities, children's homes, um, several others. They used to be spread all throughout that chart and they're all now in one section. They all had the same parking standard anyway, so that doesn't really change any of the requirements. It just makes sure that when you look for assisted living facility, you can find it and you don't have to instead go to institution for the aged, which is just kind of an outmoded term. Um, oh, and then I already mentioned that we were adding references to the downtown parking resolution. Um, next, we're creating, proposing to create some consistency in the regulations about tandem parking. So with a change in state law um, a year or two ago, the state now requires us to allow um, tandem parking for any parcel that includes an ADU. So we have to allow up to three cars to be parked in tandem. I, so I have this illustration here. This illustrates two cars being parked in tandem. And so what we currently allow on parcels with ADUs is up to three cars to be parked in tandem. So we, um, that's already codified, codified for ADUs. Um, and we wanted to extend that allowance to all residential uses. It seems to be working well for ADU pro properties. Um, we're proposing to extend that to all residential um, unit types with the caveat that um, with the exception of a single family home and an ADU, the parking for any individual unit can't be stacked with the parking of any other unit. So in a multifamily scenario, you wouldn't have, um, you know, one unit who got, would get parked in by someone living in a different household. Um, we're also strengthening and expanding our um, transportation demand management allowances. So there were already several pieces of this already in the code. We kind of rearranged it and brought it all together into one piece. Um, in section um, 2412-290 that allows um, variations from design standards and variations, reductions in the total number of required parking spaces. So um, we are working on creating a worksheet for applicants that would sort of identify, you know, of these strategies for reducing um, on-site parking demand, various different ones can reduce the parking demand by sort of different amounts. and. Um, a lot of that work has already been done. The Public Works Department recently took to the City Council um, some work on SB 743 uh, for about um, vehicle mile traveled reductions. And um, so they've done a lot of the research about what these, what each of these strategies generates in terms of reduction in parking demand. So the worksheet would be based on actual data and um, past experience and we do have <laughs> we do have Claire Gallagher here on the line with us tonight if there are any questions specifically about that, about how TDM would be implemented. Um, but so strategies for reducing parking requirements include um, on-site cooperative parking. So that's like a shopping center where there are multiple uses sharing the same parking lot. Off-site shared parking. So that's where one use might use a parking lot of, you know, uh, another use that's further down the street because they don't have enough space on their own um, own site and that policy already exists. We are proposing to increase the maximum distance to 500 feet with this update. Um, there's also a provision for non-auto use programs. So that's things like um, telecommuting, um, transit vouchers, things like that. Um, additional bike parking, that language is already also in the code you, you, for every, um, for every parking space removed, an additional six bike parking spaces need to be added um, so it, above and beyond what's already required for bike parking. Uh, and then we are proposing to add an option for unbundled parking. So this would primarily be available to residential uses, although I, I think there's probably a way it could work um, in certain commercial contexts. But in general, this creates the choice for um, someone who's purchasing housing, either excuse me, purchasing it to own or purchasing it monthly by through a lease to pay for parking or not pay for parking. So as it is currently, um, we don't have a choice. <laughs> we buy the parking that's available with the unit when we buy it or rent it. Um, we pay rent even if we aren't parking a car. So what unbundling does is it allows, um, it allows folks to make that choice. So we do wanna be mindful if we just 
unbundled parking and there's ample street parking, uh, you know, few people are going to choose the convenience of parking on site versus parking on the directly adjacent street. So we have provisions in this section that really um, would only allow this in places where there are controls on the street parking to ensure that that um, that people don't just sort of flood out of the um, project and park on the street. So the street parking within 500 feet of any entrance would have to be controlled in some manner by meters or by colored curbs or by a part, uh, permit parking, um, residential permit parking program. Um, and then lastly, you know, new ideas are going to continue to come up. So we're, we want to write that into the code to allow applicants to propose other things that we could evaluate to determine, um, you know, if they sort of meet our standard for um, allowing a reduction in parking. So the, the current code already allows, you know, all of the current TDMs would allow you to get kind of a, up to about a 30% reduction in required parking. And so we're, we're recommending that we increase that just a little bit to 35% total possible reduction. Um, we are also proposing to remove the requirement for covered parking. So currently, single family homes requires one of the, of the required parking spaces to be covered either in a garage or a carport. Um, this was something that was specifically identified in the housing blueprint work as um, sort of that easy next step to remove that would allow any existing garage to be converted to a bedroom potentially um, to a junior ADU, although junior ADUs we would also we would already avoid this um, that topic. So so parcels that have an ADU or a junior ADU are already relieved of this requirement to have a covered parking space on site. Um, and so we just thought let's just extend that also to bedrooms. You know why force someone to put the kitchen in if really what all they want is a bedroom? Let's allow that to happen. Um, and so making this change to remove uh, the requirement for covered parking means that we no longer need a whole section of code about um, conditional driveway permits. So you, you will see that in your strikeout that there's this whole long section of code that's just deleted because it's simply not necessary. A previously, a conditional driveway permit was only triggered when um, an applicant was putting in a driveway that didn't lead to a, um, that didn't lead to a destination. So it didn't terminate in a carport or a garage. So, um, if we don't have that requirement that a driveway lead to a carport or garage, we no longer need that permit. So, um, so that whole section is proposed to be deleted. Um, we are also proposing to reduce the overall parking requirements um, for residential uses. And we're also proposing to consolidate. So this is what you see here is the existing chart where we're separating out single family and townhomes from houseboats, however many of those we have in the city. Um, multifamily housing, and then community housing projects is the term we use in our municipal code for um, condominium projects for sale, multifamily housing. Um, so they, all of these different uses kind of had their own unique set of criteria and set of standards, and we're proposing to move to one standard for all residential uses. Um, efficiencies of studios and one bedrooms would require one parking space, anything two bedrooms or larger would require two parking spaces. And then any multifamily project of five or more units would additionally be required to provide um, an additional 10% of parking spaces for guest use. So um, requiring that we round up any fractional spaces would ensure that we would always have at least one guest parking space on a, um, on a multifamily project of five or more units. Um, as I just mentioned on the last slide, we are adding this guest parking standard. Um, oh, I said all this stuff already, so we'll just skip that slide. Um, okay, and then, so finally, there are a couple other little tiny things that we're cleaning up. Um, there are a bunch of illustrations at the end of the parking standard and that sort of, um, illustrate the requirements for different sort of parking lot configurations and the back out distances and the angles of the parking spaces and how all of those relate to each other. Previously, those were only contained in the illustrations. We've written some text to add those to the code of the, um, add those to the text of the code, sorry, uh, just for, for better clarity. 
we've reorganized a, a number of different things. So um, there are a couple of places where things were moved from one location to another in the ordinance, but the standard didn't change. Um, and then I do want to mention there is one thing that we noticed uh, after we published the ordinance. So um, I would like to read in this one change to um, section 2412-290.2F, which is on page 19 of the strikeout ordinance um, right at the top about parking lists. So this is in the section about variations to design requirements for parking facilities. Um, and so a, um, an applicant could apply for an administrative use permit to sort of vary from the standard requirements that we have for parking lots and parking facilities. And we are adding, proposing to add um, some text that would allow parking lists, which our code has not previously contemplated. Um, and I would like to read in that we would be adding the text that's shown here in yellow. So the section F of um, chapter 2412-290.2 would now read, parking lists or stacked parking within parking structures shall demonstrate how individual users can effectively access vehicles. Parking lists and stacked parking are not permitted except within enclosed parking structures. So um, we wanted to add this because it kind of became clear to us um, just over the last two weeks after we published uh, or settled to publish that we um, we haven't really thought about design standards or development standards that we would want to have on parking lists to have them on surface parking lots. So at this point in time, we're proposing to allow them, um, but for now only within a parking garage. So in, inside some kind of structured parking that could be, um, you know, a private garage on a on a private property, a uh, you know, single family home or otherwise, um, or you know, a commercial parking lot, but some sort of enclosed structure. So um, we did do some, com some community outreach on this. We held a virtual community meeting on, um, excuse me, on July 23rd. It was attended by about 25 residents on Zoom. Um, and we kind of ran through these topic areas and talked about what we were contemplating. And um, the comments from that meeting generated a number of ideas for future parking reforms. And several of these really would dovetail with the policy document, some of the policies that we already have in place in our policy document. So um, we do think there's some good work that could be done on these. So um, creating geographically based standards. So rather than having, you know, creating a process to allow a reduction um, in the total number of required spaces based on TDM, you know, we can kind of look at where TDM strategies already exist, so areas that are well served by transit perhaps, um, you know, maybe their parking standard starts a little bit lower than places that are less well served by transit. That would require, um, you know, a fair amount of analysis and mapping um, and really some really careful thought, but we think that's a really um, interesting idea that we should be pursuing um, in the future in the next round of parking reforms that we tackle. Um, increased control of on-street parking. So again, that's one of these things that we talk about when we reduce off-street parking, um, you know, demand on on-street parking can, can go up. And that's something that we want to be very mindful of and thinking about um, places where um, different types of controls might be appropriate um, for on-street parking and, and how, you know, what the best tools are in the different neighborhoods for achieving those um, that you know, fair distribution and access to street parking, something we'll continue to be thinking about. Um, and then we did get a comment also about evaluating um, road cross sections, so the, the way that we allocate space to sidewalks and bike lanes and travel lanes for cars and how all of those spaces interact and how much space might be between them. And um, the Public Works Department does already have a policy of um, prioritizing the highest degree of separation between modes of transit and um, that is something that we are always looking to implement. So as funding becomes available, we're looking for ways where we can, um, you know, improve pedestrian facilities um, and improve bike facilities that create the greatest amount of separation from automobile traffic. And that's something we are going to continue to work on. And it's going to—it's highly funding dependent. So our next steps after today, um, we will be bringing this item with whatever recommendation the, the commission makes tonight to the city council, um, hopefully in October, but I hear mm -hmm. the agendas are getting pretty packed, so it might be November. Um, there will be a submission to coastal commission. 
because uh, because the Coastal Commission has been recently extremely interested in how we are regulating parking in the coastal zone, we've decided to include language with this ordinance when it, um, when it would be adopted by the city council that would actually bifurcate the ordinance, which would allow it to go into effect outside the coastal zone 30 days after the city council takes action. Um, it would not be in effect inside the coastal zone until it's acted on by the coastal commission. Um, we have been talking with them about it and um, we're, we're working to make sure that we include the right kind of analysis in our staff report when we go to the city council to um, talk about how this proposal will um, still ensure that we have strong visitor access facilities in, the, in our coastal areas, that visitors still have places to park when they come and visit our beaches and coastlines. So um, we still wanna just make sure we maintain the option for it to go, for the ordinance to go into effect outside the coastal zone um, because we've been experiencing some delays recently with the Coastal Commission. So um, I'll just reiterate, our staff recommendation is that the Planning Commission recommend approval of the proposed amendments to the municipal code as proposed here and read into the record, regulating parking to the city council and including that proposed change to section 2412-290 that was read into the record. Um, so we're available to answer any questions. And again, um, I thought it might be easiest to kind of go through this by topic area, like I discussed it in the slides, if um, the commissioners would prefer to go through it in some other manner, um, you know, what, whatever is, however you think it would be easiest to discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much for the staff report. Are there questions from commissioners before we uh, open it up to the public? Uh, yes, Commissioner uh, Nielsen. Um, hi. Um, thank you for the staff report. Um, the I have a couple questions. One um, relates back to tandem parking um as it um would be in the in the multifamily example you were discussing and 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 uh, you were stating that the there would be no tandem parking allowed across units um so i'm i'm pretty sure i understand what that means um but the question i have is what about adus um that are on those um within the multifamily are adus allowed to park tandem because they're allowed in the single family to park tandem that's a good question um so the way that um the way that the code is written for um adus i don't think it distinguishes between multifamily and single family uses and it just says cars can be parked up to triple tandem um this, I'll admit that that does get a little complicated when ADUs on multifamily property aren't necessarily connected to one specific unit. Um, Actually, let me, I, I may have an answer to that. <laughs> well, I don't know, maybe I don't. Um, ADUs aren't required to have parking, right? So right. then maybe right, that's not an can, issue. It, yeah, I mean, so, it, so ADUs right now outside the coastal zone, um, right. ADUs are not required to have provide any parking. Um, they can have parking. I, yeah, I, I'll be honest. Mm -hmm. That's not a that's not a scenario we have specifically addressed in these or these amendments tonight. The way that it's written in the ADU ordinance um, doesn't distinguish between single family and multifamily. And so I think the way if we were interpreting our code as it's currently drafted and written in the other section. Um, ADUs probably could end up tandem with another unit. So that okay. may be something it, okay. that we should take okay. into account. Okay, thank you. Um, and then the other question I have uh, is with the parking lifts um, where you're, say, uh, you're stating that they're, um, they would only be allowed um, within an enclosed parking structure. Um, does it have to be, I mean, it, it doesn't appear that it's, that it's um, clarified whether it has to be like inside the structure or can it be on the roof of the structure? Because I know that there's parking structures that are enclosed, but you can go all the way to the roof and it's and it's open mm. um, on the roof. So 
Was that in, right. is there an intent there from staff in terms of what that's supposed to, what the, what the intent of that is? Great question. Um, coming in with these great ones tonight, Commissioner Nielsen, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Sorry, so, parking no, is my that, thing. I, mean, I, I, I can help with that too. That, that's to, to contemplate that. Um, Matt, did you have something to say? Sure, I can, I can help with that. Uh, Commissioner Nielsen, uh, Matt Benoit, Principal Planner. Um, yeah, as far as the, the parking structures go uh, and and uh, uh, lifts, they, they would be a lot on the roofs. Um, the main the main goal with allowing them only instructor parking scenarios was to remove them from uh, visual impacts, uh, especially from like a pedestrian right of way. Uh, so if, if they were on a roof of an actual parking structure, that, that wouldn't be uh, as much of an issue so long as it still met the height requirements and things like that. Okay. I, I think that, I mean, to me that makes sense. I mean, it's uh, a lot of the stru parking structures we have in the city don't have very um, high ceiling heights. And so it seems like it may be challenging to, to get lifts within the structure anyway. So. Um, having them on the roof, um, to me, that seems fine. So, thank you. Those are my questions. Other commissioners have questions before we open it up to the public? Yes, Commissioner Dawson. Yeah, I just wanted to ask staff, so, so is there a re requirement for a generator for these lifts? Because what happens if the power goes out? How do you get your car? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I actually don't know enough about how the lifts work to know if they, um, you know, include their own battery or if it's mechanical. I honestly, that's, a, I haven't, I don't know the answer to that. Does anybody know how these lifts work? I've never interacted with one personally. Um, no, I don't know. Public lifts do tend to have a backup generator with them. Um, but private lifts are tend to be connected with a with a parking lot, and, and that's really up to the the property owner to decide whether that would go in or not. Okay. So just to clarify, so currently in our ordinance, um, the the proposed language um, doesn't include that that requirement. That would be optional. Okay. Correct. Uh, yeah, it's not the in optional, there as a requirement. Optional makes it. Uh, it's not a requirement. We don't comment on it. So optional makes it sound like they could just choose not to include power, which is not really the case. Um, but it's not a specific requirement that they have a backup generator. We didn't, you know, that's not in the code as it's proposed today. Okay. Thank you. Other commissioners? I have one question at this time. It's on page four under the uh, TDM where it's increasing um, the parking reductions from 30 to 35 percent. The staff report includes that the uh, proposal would not impact street parking, uh, yet the ordinance on page 19 doesn't say that. Um, was that just an oversight? Um, so, um So the, the point of the administrative use permit is for the VA to have a chance to evaluate the proposal and determine if they qualify for this reduction. Um, and so the strategies that are contained there would, you know, the, the way that, that we're envisioning this process working, the, um, the developer would make a proposal. They, the, zoning administrator or you know designated staff member would be reviewing that proposal and the criteria they would be comparing that to is um, you know whether there would be an off-site impact and if it doesn't say that or um, maybe that is worth stating explicitly um, the language in the again. ordinance says on uh, in number G or whatever it's under an analysis by a transportation uh, engineer, other qualified specialist, may re be required by the decision-making bo body as a means to um, substantiate the requested parking, re um, the, a parking mm -hmm. reduction. 
but it doesn't say um, that that should be based on um, not having an on impact. On off-site. Okay. And demonstrate the proposal will not have an impact on street parking. I think that that, that I think, to be consistent with what's in the staff report and what I think is important, mm -hmm. that, in my view, mm -hmm. it should be considered to be added to the uh, uh, ordinance. Claire? You have your hand up. Yeah, I, uh, thank you. Claire Glugley, Transportation Planner for the City in Public Works. I wanted to add into that 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 is the intent here, and one of the reasons that we will be um, working up the worksheet for transportation demand management is to make sure that the proposed solutions that are um, put forth by a developer match actual realistic options. So if a project located outside of a transit priority area with high quality transit says that they're going to use transit to reduce their parking requirement. That's not something that we would say yes to, to reduce their parking because it wouldn't be a realistic solution. Um, you know, likewise, uh, unbundling of parking in an area that doesn't have existing parking management would lead to spillover parking into the neighborhood and would have an adverse effect um, potentially on what's already there. So making sure that we match the proposed solution to, to something that's actually feasible. The intent is to not create a new neighborhood issue. Because I'll tell you, um, at, on the public works side, we, we field those calls. Does that, um, does that mean that you would be supportive of adding some language into the ordinance that makes that clear? That would say to I would be, um, I'd look to Sarah, that, that's the intent of it, how to make that language, Sarah, I'd look to you for that. Yeah, I was actually just trying to scribble down a sentence here that we could insert into the um, into number three that clarified um, something along these lines. Uh, so I would add it in the after the sentence that says this may be done using one or more of the following strategies or an approved equivalent subject to any standards contained herein. And based on an analysis, I would add this language and based on an analysis of any potential offsite impact or, you know, something like that. So that is the intent, is that this would be based, this would be balancing. I want to be cautious here, though. I, I, let's, let's not pretend that there will be zero offsite impact, okay? Um, we are always going to be looking to balance those things, right? Parking takes up, as I mentioned, just an enormous amount of city land, um, urban land, and it doesn't do anything. But be occupied with cars or be, you know, relatively vacant or occasionally hold a very delightful farmer's market or antiques fair. But those are really rare events. So um, I, there will be a balancing that occurs between the um, effects that are off-site and the reduction that is on-site and the benefit that the project brings. That's the point of having a discretionary process that's evaluated by the zoning administrator. So. Um, it is the intent that those would be analyzed and considered, and um, I, am, I am not going to recommend that we put in language that says there will be zero offsite impact because I just don't think that's really, po it's po I don't think it's possible to analyze that or predict that. So. And well, it's not possible to measure on the back end. Or it says, mm -hmm. and to demonstrate the proposal will not impact street parking on page uh, four. But, I, you know, I... So, yeah. What you're saying, that's, um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's consistent with the rest of the discussion. Uh, let me just say that uh, most houses just sit there all day with nobody in them. Um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have houses. Most people have cars. Uh, in fact, almost everybody has a car. And that means that the piece of, uh, of, a piece of equipment that takes up space, it's unrealistic to think that that's, that's there isn't going to be the need to put that equipment someplace. So just say mm -hmm. that, that there's, you know, it doesn't do anything. It does, you know, people are very uh, enamored with their automobiles. And the overwhelming majority have them and want them. And mm -hmm. cluttering them. public streets with them is not necessarily um, what most people want. So anyway, this is, uh, mm -hmm. I, I was trying not to get into discussions, but does anybody, if nobody else has questions, um, I'm going to open it up to the public. A member of the public has asked for four minutes um, to make a presentation. I said, okay. Um, so I hope that person is on the line and I'm going to open the public hearing and call on him to make his presentation. 
and um, chair, this is the clerk. I'm going to, I do see a member of the public raise their hand and I just wanna let him know that um, I'm gonna walk across the room and go set up his PowerPoint. So I'll start the timer once the PowerPoint's up. All right, thank you. Uh, speaker. Speaker. You're on the line. Give me one moment. Hi, um, this is Rick Longinotti, uh, the co-chair of the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, so just let me know when the slides are up and I'll signal you when to advance. Um, but I did want to say while we're waiting for that, just that um, I really appreciate when I read the staff report about the parking reform agenda, I, I thought, you know, I wished everybody had a chance to read this. I mean, it, it, it's really an excellent report and it makes a great case for parking reform. I think this is one of the uh, areas where uh, the Planning Commission can make a really a big impact on housing affordability and also reduce vehicle trips at the same time. And one of the sleepers tonight, I, I think in terms of impact, is removing the covered parking requirement. Uh, aside from, Speaker, uh, you know, Kirk, your, your yes. presentation is now on the screen. As soon as you start addressing the slides, your timer starts. I don't okay. see the screen. Uh, Hold on just yes, a I don't see it. share my clerk's screen one more I can run it. Would that be easier? Uh, that would be easier because the screen that we're televising from doesn't have a camera, apparently. Oh, okay. Well, let me... Um, let me do this. Thank you. Sure, happy to help. Okay, okay Rick. Okay, uh, great. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, and I, I actually already said that I appreciate the staff for their report and advance it to the next slide, slide number three with the graphs. Mm -hmm. um, what, what the students of Adam Millard Ball uh, found, they went out uh, on three successive nights into these large uh, apartment building complexes and they counted parking spots and they found that there were lots of empty parking spaces on the average around 35 percent empty parking spaces what that suggests is that our existing code results in overbuilt parking um, by about 35 percent but it's actually worse than that because if you consider you know all the ucsc students who live off campus which is about half of the 19,000 students and how many of them own cars, um, and how many of them bring their cars to Santa Cruz when they go to school, that must be thousands of cars. And if they had to pay for parking, such as with an unbundled parking policy, um, we'd see a lot less cars on, on our roads. Next slide, please. Um, so what's wrong with more parking than we need? Next slide. Well, it does result in higher construction costs, particularly when it's structured parking. You know, this is the uh, 555 Pacific building, which has two levels of underground parking. The, the, you know, we're getting into seventy and $80,000 per parking space there. Um, and I've already discussed about how it results in more driving. Next slide, please. So the staff's proposal is, you know, is modest changes. Um, 
the, it, it, for example, it doesn't change the requirement that a two-bedroom apartment have two parking spaces. Next slide. Um, the problem with that is, is an affordability issue because 55% of the rental households in Santa Cruz own one car or less. So if you're thinking about rental households who live in a two-bedroom apartment that has that required two, bedroom, two parking spaces, you know, one of those parking spaces is going unused for, for a significant number of people, and yet they're paying for it. Next slide, please. Um, so the request that I would have is to ask staff uh, to bring back more extensive changes to the parking code and starting with downtown and downtown has similar parking requirements to the rest of the city actually right now. Um, next slide, please. The reason to focus on downtown is because we already have the parking permit program. And by the way, since you've already discussed that, I would say that um, a well-managed parking permit program does is very effective. It is very effective in a preventing spillover parking. Next slide, please. Uh, so communities that have removed minimum parking requirements, um, we're, um, you know, we're following the lead of, of, of lots of different cities. Next slide. Um, the unbundling, which you've also already talked about, it's been sort of on the table for years and years. Um, the master transportation study called on us to do that way back in 2003. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. So we know that it results in lower housing costs through empirical studies, and we know that it results in lower vehicle ownership. So it's really a win-win. Uh, and the question that I ask myself and or ask you is that if you can think of any other way that reducing parking requirements for developers would actually, where the savings would go to the resident, you know, it's going to lower costs for developers, but would they pocket that cost or would they pass it on to the, save, to the tenants? And I think unbundling parking does that. And I can't think of other ways to do that. Maybe other ways to do it, but I haven't thought of any. Next slide, please. Here's an example of an unbundled parking building in Berkeley. Uh, there's just 20 cars using their 42 parking spaces that they built for 91 apartments. Next slide. Um, we already have an example of requiring transportation demand management measures. Uh, the Pacific Shores Apartments, which was approved uh, some years back on Schaefer Road, where the developer pays for a bus pass. And so I, I would suggest that, you know, that the, the unbundling and the requirement for TDM in new development be extended, you know, first of all in the downtown and then along transit corridors. But, but let's try it downtown. I think, it, uh, you know, let's try it and see how it works. And, uh, starting there and, and, you know, could make a huge difference in housing affordability. Next slide. Um, the other thing I would recommend as far as reducing uh, transportation demand would be to ask private developers to exercise local workforce preference. So in their applications, they give priority to local workers, local residents. Uh, in Santa Barbara, they even give priority to uh, residents who don't own a car. And we have that precedent in our public housing, the Tannery Arts Building, Santa Cruz. Next slide, please. So just a summary, please ask the staff to return with a more ambitious parking reform proposal for downtown. Their, their agenda report really calls for something more ambitious than, than what you've got before you. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else from the public who wants to speak on this item? any other members of the public that wish to address the Commission? Okay, going once, going twice. Um, I'll then close the public hearing and bring this back to the Commission. Um, we'll take comments from Commissioners on the proposed changes. Commissioner Spellman. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you know, I want to thank staff, you know, for this report. I think, although we started out talking about how uh, non-exciting parking can be uh, as far as a topic. This really is a big deal. And I think the last presenter sort of highlighted this. Um, there's no doubt that we can be substantially more proactive in how we consider parking and its impact on housing. Um, you know, it trickles down to everything, it, you know, in the big picture, less parking, more housing in general, right, is, is the theme. 
And I think there's no doubt that uh, Mr. Longinotti, I believe, was you know looking for a comparison to um, the unbundled parking comparison and other incentives for reducing parking. I think um, for sure you could quantify how many additional housing units are we getting just by reducing the parking requirements. So yes, there may be more money in the pockets of, of uh, a developer per se because they can build more units, but the community at large also benefits, you know, from from having more units available. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's a huge deal. Um, and I think for as boring a topic as it may be, um, we had some very um, poignant comments from um, the, the community at large on this. There were, besides from Mr. Longinotti, there was another gentleman who um, had very in-depth discussion of pretty much about all of the major salient points that were made. And I think his point was more about um, treading lightly, so to speak, and making sure the issues were thought through as far as potential impacts to neighborhoods and the overall uh, quality of life, let's call it, for both pedestrians, bicyclists, the larger transportation um, system in, in play. And I think we should be very smart and attuned to those concerns. Um, but I think at this moment, I would err on, um, you know, more substantial change. Um, it's been for sure years, if not decades, for many of these issues to, you know, rise to the top to actually get into an ordinance. and. I think if we were to err wrongly, slightly in some areas, ways to correct that. But this is a substantial step to, you know, address some really fundamental issues for the city. So I, I am very much in favor of the proposed changes, and I'm also searching for ways to challenge us to go further if there's an appropriate uh, way to add that into our recommendation to the council. Other commissioners? Commissioner Greenberg? Somehow you're still muted. Um, I was just uh, going to echo Commissioner Selman and both thank the, the staff for the great support and work that's gone into this um, and ambitious vision. And um, also, I really appreciate the comments from uh, the uh, public and from Rick Longinotti and his, you know, uh, research as well and drawing on research of um, my colleague here at UCSB, Adam Miller, and his students, um, looking at the, the overbuilding, really, the, you know, the oversupply of parking in the downtown. Um, and uh, to echo Commissioner Selman and saying that I think if we can go further, that's a great idea. And it's really, um, while there are downsides, there are multiple kind of winners in this. Um, the winners in terms of, you know, I don't think developers would be averse to this. I think, obviously, I think that um, would provide more housing. Uh, I think it also would really benefit, obviously, our metro bus system. Um, and if there were ways to, also, in addition to the unbundling, to um, allow for bus passes and, and other things and to really um, incentivize the use of transit more in Santa Cruz, which I feel is really underutilized um, to the degree that it needs to be and has all kinds of ripple effects as well um, in the ability of the, of the system itself to, um, to expand and invest and so forth and, 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 uh, and reach as many uh, parts of the community as it needs to and to be as um, efficient as it needs to be. So um, I think if there were ways that we could consider transportation demand management approaches um, within, this, uh, with, within this recommendation, that would be great, um, along with um, ways of supporting uh, uh, use of uh, the buses and I know that the, that the council has supported this in the past, for instance, having the um, vouchers for the bus system provided for those who are working downtown um, 
finally, I also like the idea of having people who are building downtown prioritize those who are working downtown to enable people to actually walk to work. So, thank you. That's my comment. Other commissioners? Um, well, I have comments that are completely opposite from two previous commissioners. Um, <laughs> Every project that comes before us, we hear from the neighbors about how the streets are overwhelmed with parking, uh, with cars being parked. Uh, I just think there's a lot of delusions about what um, eliminating parking does. Um, I think the notion that somehow in a community like Santa Cruz that's, as built, that's built the way it is with a generally low densi lower density areas to think that the bus system is going to be able to mimic what happens in places like San Francisco and New York is just not realistic. People use cars because they need to use cars. Uh, uh, the Transit District and the Transportation Commission has been trying to encourage people to carpool, to use buses, um, <clears throat> providing more uh, housing along transit corridors to the extent that people still have their jobs separate from their housing, it's, it's just not going to matter. And my sense is with developers, um, market rate developers charge what the market's going to bear. And if they can charge more, they'll charge more whether they have to do parking or not. So there are some of the uh, proposed changes that I'm fine with. Um, I don't have any problem with uh, those proposed in Section 1 through 5. Um, I support uh, um, not having covered parking. My sense is that covered parking when their garages isn't really providing parking anyway. And so uh, why have the illusion that it is? I mean, it's, a, it's primarily used for storage or uh, housing purposes anyway. So at least it should be expected to be that way uh, from the beginning. I, I um, Given that we have a university town, and I'm not sure um, the number of students that have cars um, by their houses, but I know in neighborhoods, the, having complaints from neighbors about the number of students in a, in a house and the number of cars that are then on the street, to think that a five-bedroom house can, should only have two parking spaces seems, um, seems silly to me. Uh, I don't support unbundled parking. I think it, I think it has their social justice, social equity issues. The people assuming that most people, if not the vast majority of people, will have cars. The people with more money will pay for the parking, and the people with less money will be you know, driving around the neighborhood trying to find a place to park. Um, so I, uh, I'm not supportive of that. Um, Let me see if there is anything else with guest parking. I was, uh, I didn't think that going from a 25% uh, requirement to a 10% requirement was only slightly lower. And I think uh, I know in, in in projects that I'm familiar with out in the Mid County area, um, the lack of of uh, off street parking just um, causes all sorts of problems on the uh, residential and collector streets. So I, I would I would support 15 percent, but I'm not willing to support 10 percent. Um, let's see. And you know, let me just my, my final comment is um, I mostly ride my bike around town. I don't uh, take my car very uh, far, and I live in a development that has uh, sufficient uh, covered and uncovered parking. Uh, so it's not a problem for me, but it, it burns me every time I ride my bike to the farmer's market to see Washington Street downtown has become uh, essentially a private parking lot. And members of the public who pay for the maintenance of that street cannot park there. And I think it's really unfortunate, but it's a sign of the future, given these parking ordinance changes, that our public streets are going to become par private parking lots. Now m most residential streets have two-hour limits, um, but I think after we uh, see the results of th these kinds of changes, there's going to be more and more pressure to not allow anybody to park on the street except the residents who have permits. 
And I think this is an unfortunate use of a public resource uh, and um, will end up with no ends of problems. My sister lived in Jersey City for a while where the houses were all built without any off-street parking. And the fights that she saw among her neighbors over parking spaces where a person would have a, you know, would be out there fighting anybody who tried to park in the space in front of their house. That's the direction we're moving in. And I think um, it's a step backward, not as being uh, argued a step forward. So those are my comments. Uh, this is the clerk. I just wanted to let you know that a uh, member of the public raised their hand late. Um, so I'll let you deal with that later. I just wanted to make you aware of that. Why don't we hear from Commissioner Conway then, uh, the staff person, Sarah, and then we can hear from the member of the public. Go ahead, Commissioner Conway. Okay, thank you. Um, and I wanna also thank staff for the report and, and especially the really inspired introduction. Um, and I agree with uh, much of what's been said, including um, Chair Schiffman. Um, and I actually very strongly support the staff recommendation um, because uh, we are in a time of change. We are moving from uh, uh, community and society that dedicates so much land to the automobile and really prioritizes the use of our land for the convenience of the automobile. Um, that is changing um, and I think we see it changing. We're gonna continue to see it changing more. I think our current circumstances with uh, working from home are, are gonna really uh, change a lot of how we do things. At the same time, I really agree with Chair Schifrin and I know some of those mid-county neighborhoods and um, I learned my lesson about parking back when I was a, a affordable housing builder. Um, it, we're just, it's so depressing to have to reduce the number of affordable units you can build um, in order to provide parking that you know is gonna stand empty. Just absolutely disheartening. That said, um, there was a philosophy somewhere in the murky days of the 70s that probably only Commissioner Schifrin and I remember, um, but where there was a really a, a, a planning belief that if you don't build parking, people stop driving. And um, it was, maybe it, we could call it visionary, but what it ended up causing was a backlash. Um, and I think we do see neighbors, um, it's one of the primary um, arguments against density and housing projects that we hear is um, people who live in neighbors, neighborhoods that either are impacted or parking isn't managed well. Um, and it, it, makes, it makes life very uncomfortable and I think we've all seen changes over time. Um, so for this reason, I really, really support the um, pivot that the city is making um, to be very considerate and thoughtful about how it requires parking and at the same time to not make that step too much too fast um, because I think it's realistic. We're, while we're in a time of change, um, we haven't changed yet. So I really strongly support the staff recommendation and if when we come to it, I'll be willing to make a, uh, a motion to that effect. Um, uh, I wanted to hear uh, Ms. Millis, you're, you're up. Yes, hi, I just had one clarifying comment. Um, Chair Schifrin, you commented that the guest parking was changing to, um, from 25% to 10%. Um, the way the standard is written now, um, it says that one additional parking space for each four dwelling units will be provided. So it's not for four parking spaces, it's for four dwelling units. So if each dwelling unit has re re requires two parking spaces, um, one for four units is one eighth, which works out to about 12 and a half percent. So that's where we're getting our numbers of like declining it to 10% is a modest decrease. So that's our logic, that's all. Okay, well thanks for that clarification. Let's hear from the member of the public and then we'll go back to Commissioner Dawson. You have three minutes. Yes, um, hello? Please identify yourself. 
Can you hear me? Yes. My name is Candace Brown again, and um, yeah, I did click in three times right after Rick, just so you know, it wasn't acknowledged. Um, they didn't see it, I guess. Um, so parking is basically um, the gateway to d high density, and so it has to be done very carefully, and I would recommend highly that any changes be proposed downtown, which is where you have um, already the, the potential to experiment with um, some of these parking innovations uh, because you do have parking amenities around high density already in place. When looking at the quarter plan, um, it was reviewed over 18 month period and they did models on the parking and found that there was so much deficit because most of the parking lots in the area, because there really wasn't the infrastructure to allow for the high density. So if you impose these parking restrictions without the amenities of infrastructure that you have downtown, you're really imposing tremendously on the surrounding neighborhoods. And it was so dramatic that they said that when they did the modeling on Soquel, that it was short 600 spaces for public parking because of the commercial requirements, and that was only at half the requirement, which was normally um, one parking space or, you know, they did it like half of what it should have been basically for commercial. And then for private, they, they were short like another 1,500. So just for the public space alone, they were short, you know, eight Whole Food parking lots. And so, you know, in order, you really need to do some modeling because you have a lot of, um, you're not just looking at parking, you're looking at the density associated with the parking. And without doing this modeling, you don't realize that you might be imposing in a way that's so dramatic that you will just completely gut a particular neighborhood. At 603, uh, they did unbundle the parking, and they're charging, I think, about $100 um, so people can afford to pay it because they're raising the rent every six months. And um, it's so dramatic that they can't, but yet they still have a car. And so um, they are parking on the street. They're fighting for the parking on the street. They even had an appeal that came to the Transportation Commission just because of the change of one parking space to a loading zone because there's such tight parking there. And so, um, and we, when those, uh, when they tried to add 20 new units, we tried to convince the developer to impose, to actually pay for bus passes for 25% of the people in those units. And that was like 13,000 per year, and they said that was too expensive. Um, but we are trying to, you know, trying to put some of those things in place so that you know it discourages people from using their car. But it's really not happening. Students, they are now packing in at two to three per room. They're still parking their cars. They're taking the buses up to campus. But um, there has to be some incentive for them not to bring their cars to town. Otherwise, the uh, neighborhoods are seeing um, tremendous impact from student housing. So I've run out of time, but yeah, be very cautious when you implement some of these regulations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, Commissioner Dawson, you're next. Yeah, I'll just uh, be brief and, and say that um, I feel very torn about parking because all of this really comes down to math, right? So we're trying to balance all of these different things. Um, I will say that in the Seabright neighborhood, um, I know streets like Galt, which is very close to where I live, um, there, there is with the current parking, um, people are circling constantly. And so I know that we need to move in this direction, but I also just want to um, hope that we as a commission can be very cautious and not be going out until we try these things out. I think the suggestion to focus our efforts around downtown to try these things out for a little bit, um, if we're going to make additional changes, makes a lot of sense. And I will also just say, that hopefully as we continue to move from a, a non-carbon economy, um, people are still going to need ways to get around. And whether it's um, a, an electric car or a hybrid car, it still uh, takes up space. And so we need to just be realistic and pragmatic about um, the fact that, the, that we are going to still need some amount of space for this. And I also just want to point out that um, a lot of us um, have the privilege of being, having jobs and um, vocations that allow us to work from home, but folks that work in the service industry and other low-paying uh, jobs, they have to get to where they're going. 
um, and some of them are, are living in spaces that are very far away from where that is. And there are transportation challenges within our system just for the density here in Santa Cruz County. So I think we just need to be very judicious as we go forward, but I also realize we need to move in this direction. Thanks. Uh, yes, Commissioner Nielsen. Uh, I just wanted to um, go back to something that Commissioner Spellman said um, kind of at the beginning. And it's, I feel like it's a uh, pretty good statement. I mean, it's, you know, we're, we're talking about parking, you know, or, you know, um, um, housing cars versus housing people. Um, I think it's, <clears throat> in my mind, it's pretty clear that, you know, the with the changes that are being proposed in the staff report, um, lead the way to um to be able to create more housing um and um and also cut down on on restrictions you know even within um single family housing where you know we're you know with the with getting rid of the, the covered parking i think is a i think is a big move and i think it's a it's a i think it's something that um that's been in the works for a really long time i mean i remember hearing from staff about this possibility, it was probably six years ago. And so it just shows how slow these things move, you know, through the system. So, and it just seems, and it does, and it feels like uh, it's like such a simple thing in terms of, you know, getting rid of, you know, covered parking, but it just, it takes a long, it takes a lot of time. Um, to go through that system and and obviously you know as as commissioner conway was saying it's like it's like that particular thing is like so poignant right now because with um with where we're at with working from home it just creates a lot of opportunity for people um to be able to use that space in a, in a better way um but just going back to the but just going back to housing i i think um i the, the staff report, I think, is good. I fully support it. <clears throat> I am, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm interested in ways that it could be stronger. I don't exactly know where that is <clears throat> um, at the moment, but, um, you know, I'm, I'd be happy if staff continued to explore that and figure out ways, and particularly in the downtown area. I mean, let's, I think the staff report is great. Let's go with that, and you know, let's explore other ways we can continue to to um, you know to reduce our our you know requirement for parking within the downtown area, <clears throat> and see how that works, um, and you know, and, and how you know, and how that's going to affect our ability to create more housing. Because I you know I think that's a um, that's something that, that we're all in favor of doing. And so we're just trying to figure out a way to get there. And I think this is a good a good move and it's in the right direction. So thank you. Any other commissioners have comments they'd like to make? <clears throat> okay, would somebody like to make a motion? Commissioner Conway. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'd like to move the staff recommendation. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, discussion. I would ask uh, the maker of the motion, the second, if they'd be willing to add uh, the following language to um, a section that in uh, variations to the parking, section G, that says an analysis by a transportation engineer or other qualified specialist may be required by the decision-making body as a means to substantiate the requested parking reduction, uh, would you be willing to add the language and to demonstrate that the pro proposal will not impact street parking? Uh, let's see. I don't suppose you have a visual of that, do you? Uh, I, it do sounds, you have a page it, number? It sounds, it's on page yeah. 19 of the uh, the or of the ordinance. The ordinance. Okay, sorry. And uh, actually, on page four of the staff report is where the staff report 
said that that would be one of the requirements, but it doesn't show up in the ordinance itself. So okay. I was going to add it to the ordinance. I just took the language okay. right from the staff report. Oh, the staff report. Um, yeah, I, um, I, I would be all right with that if the second is. Second? Well, can you explain what section this is in? Because I'm I'm on page four and I'm not in, I don't see a G. Or at uh, least I think I'm on page for four. For the staff report, page nineteen of the ordinance. Oh, okay. The ordinance doesn't have the language. The staff report has the language. Here, I'm sharing my screen. Okay, um, thank so we're, you. We're okay. In this I actually I only ha I'm sorry this is the this is the clean version of the ordinance so the page number this is not page number 19 but um, this is the section that Chair Schifrin is referring to so we're he here in the G is that different um, A B C D E F I'm gonna I'm gonna say my numbering is wrong in the um, strikeout version in, in attachment two it is G. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So in the strikeout version, if you look in attachment two on page twenty, it's G. G. Right. I'm yeah. sorry. It's twenty. It goes from E to G, so it should be F. But it should be F. I caught that yeah. in the clean version. <laughs> Apologies. So we're looking at this oh, okay. sentence. Okay. All right. And Chair Schifrin wanted to add language to the end of this, which I can type in if he would be so kind of to restate it. Okay. Sure. May I um, add a comment here from a transportation perspective? This is yeah, Claire. Yeah, that Please. Let me language out, and then you could add a comment. Okay. Okay. Um, it would be, and this is taken from the staff report, and to demonstrate that the proposal will not impact street parking. Oh. Actually. I'd like to hear from, from Claire, but um, seeing that, I have a, a comment on it as well. Okay, yeah, thank you. So, yeah, Claire Gorsley, really transportation planner. So my, my first comment here would just be that models are often wrong, but sometimes useful, right. which is um, great advice given <laughs> to me by George Dondero, the former executive director of RTC. And that is to say that with the language here to demonstrate that the proposal will not impact street parking, there may be any number of things that happen with a proposed right. project that at the at the time of implementation and at the time of occupation, there may be a variety of impacts or non-impacts on the surrounding neighborhood. The intent that we would go for is to mm -hmm. have, a, have a minimal to, to no impact on street parking, but that will likely ebb and flow over the time that the development is there over the way that a neighborhood would change. Um, but looking at the tools that we have here, really the intent is to match data-driven TDM tools based on the CAPCOA guidelines with TDM strategies that are appropriate to a given location. Um, and so un understanding your intent here to, to not impact street parking, I think the closest yeah. that we can get is that that's our intent, but there is not a realistic way that I could implement the language that you proposed. And and I agree with that, and I apologize, Chair Schifrin. Um, I think that this has to have some qualifier in there. I'm supportive of um, ensuring that there's an analysis of the impact on street parking and that that's taken into account, but I don't think it's going, if uh, this language like this, is gonna make it impossible to be useful. So some mitigating language, like maybe, um, uh, and to demonstrate that the pro proposal has um, analyzed the impact, analyzed and minimized the impact on street parking. What if it just said would not impact street parking if feasible? I don't think that quite works because I, I, I agree with the goal, um, but I feel like, um, it's important, and I think Claire put it um, really well in technical language, but I, I feel like we, we want it to be um, analyzed. We want it to be taken into account, um, but a, a, a hard stop like that is gonna make it hard to move forward. Yeah, Claire, do you have an idea on language? Yeah, well, my other note there would be also 
I, I like the point about to maybe analyze and and present to the decision making body and Sarah, apologies, yeah. they don't remember what level of review this is here. But I think that there are some cases that you will accept, you may accept that there will be on street parking issues. And that may be that you're getting a certain type of housing or a certain type of project that is worth the trade off to having some potential spillover. And it may be 100% affordable housing or some other supportive type housing that you want to get. And so I think acknowledging that you can analyze it and, and have that information be made available with the intent that it's minimized, but leaving it open for your decision making. So I like that language. I'm just adding this. This is this would be my suggestion here in purple. I don't know if this uh -huh. is where you where you want to go. I, I can take notes on whatever you want to do. Uh, this, uh, this language reflects is something that I can support. Is that a, is it okay to second? Who seconded it? Who seconded it? I did. Um, I did. Oh, Nielsen, I'm sorry. Sorry, Christian. Oh, I, oh, sorry, Ann. I am unmuted. <laughs> um, well, I think I guess um, so. The, I guess my question is: is that you, what you're trying to accomplish is you, is that you you want to you you want an analysis? Is I guess is the analysis required or just? I mean, because it does say may be required, so it doesn't mean that it would actually be required in all cases. Is that is this is this true? And it says Claire. And, and if okay, go ahead, Claire. Yeah, I can assist you on that. So what we're, we're going to make a matrix for this. It's going to be a TDM matrix, and it is going to have reduction factors associated with it. So previously in our code, we had you could get a 10% reduction in parking if you substituted car parking with bike parking, and a 10% reduction if you did TDM measures, unqualified what they were, and a 10% reduction if you did um, shared cooperative parking there. So we're going to have it be more mimicked to the recent SB 743 policy language that council adopted, which uses CAPCOA guidelines, which are research-based to the amount of reduction that you can actually get as a result of TDM measures, which is a really technical way to say that many of these things can be measured. And if something else is proposed that can't be measured, that would be a time when we may pull in this analysis here. If it's something that we don't already have an established standard on how much we would reduce. So if someone comes in and they're proposing something really sense. innovative or different that we haven't contemplated before, I would love to pull in an outside hmm. expert that has experience in that to say, here's the amount of reduction that we can give. But it, it would be more specific. It would be more the exception than the rule is how I see this working out. Okay. So I guess what I'm, the way I understand that then is, is that this is kind of a, um, like you said, it's more the exception than the rule. And, um, and just by the virtue of their analysis being done, that's going to be reviewed by the decision-making party or body, and they can make decisions about um, whether it meets the needs or the goals or, or if it has impact. So I don't feel like we need this additional language. So you're not willing to accept that amendment? No, I don't. I don't think it's necessary. Okay. Um, any other comments? The motion is as a, to just support the staff recommendation. Are there any other commissioner comments? Yes, Commissioner Green, uh, Greenberg. You're muted. Commissioner Greenberg, you're muted. I feel like that there's a couple of different <laughs> meetings that I have to come over today. Um, I appreciate what the transportation planners have been doing, and I feel like we are entering into a new era where there are going, we can't always anticipate, you know, the potential of forms of ride sharing and of, you know, van pooling and of other alternative transportation approaches. Um, the younger generation is very pro transit in a way that the older generation was not. 
So um, I think we should be open to that and encouraging that in every way we can. And so having some kind of, um, I, I agree with the spirit of where we're going here, that having a fixed hard stop on impact on street parking is not taking into consideration these potential future approaches. Um, and uh, that we shouldn't be afraid of that and that things can change and that it can be in a good direction here. And um, even while we need to be aware of different parts of town, and I do hear this, the concern about, you know, the distinction between places that have infrastructure on the downtown versus areas that, that don't as much. And so, um, and I think that's something that the transportation planners are really taking into consideration here um, and through the staff report. So, um, so I support. Any other comments from now. commissioners? Well, I'm not gonna support the motion. Um, I don't uh, consider myself as someone who can predict the future one way or the other, uh, unlike loads of other people. When I was in graduate school, I was told we'd have driverless cars within 10 years. Or more. And so, you know, who knows what's gonna happen next. And when young people get older, young people may not, older people may not have values for people. Have an attract, you know, have a, a, a need and uh, and a commitment to their uh, their mode of transportation, the way they get around. Yeah. I, what, uh, my buying objection to this is it is policy um, decision that ignores the quality of life in neighborhoods, and a very unfortunate direction for the city to be going in and it bodes for additional um, friction, uh, opposition, um, and you know, when, when pro-housing people like to complain about the NIMBYs, well, people in neighborhoods, uh, oftentimes what they're really worried about is um, the quality of life based on how it is, how able they are to get around their neighborhoods. So I think this is, uh, uh, most of this I could go along with, but the overall philosophy, I don't agree with, and so I'm going to vote no. So let's have a roll call vote. Commissioner Conway? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Uh, Greenberg? Yes. Nielsen? Aye. Selmick? Aye. Maxwell? Aye. Kipren? No. That is the motion passes six to one, um, <clears throat> and we would now we will now move on to the next item. Um, could I ask the clerk whether there are people uh, waiting to speak to this item? Uh, the same speaker that spoke to the last item had uh, raised their hand again. Um, I don't know if you're moving on to the new item. You've just disposed of that one, but somebody else just raised their hand. We talk about the parking ordinance item. Uh, well, you just you just wrapped that up. So um, as, as you did that, someone just raised their hand. So I don't know how you want to proceed with that. Well, we're done with the parking ordinance item. I'm afraid um, the, since the commission has already acted on it. Um, they may be waiting for the next one, Chair. I'm not sure. We can find out when you get there. Okay. Well, we're kind of here, and um, we could have a whole staff report, but I have a, a, a fundamental Brown Act concern with the uh, public uh, discussion of this item. Um, it does not mention the, the essential gutting of the slope regulations. Uh, is not, this is not a cleanup ordinance. This is an ordinance that's fundamentally changing uh, the city's slope regulations. It's changing um, the landscape and open space requirements for uh, the, um, the, the ADU ordinance. There are a number of changes in this uh, proposal that I don't think in any way, shape, or form could be justified as cleanup. And I, I we can have the public, we can have the staff report, we can have the public hearing, but I think that the way this ordinance is noticed to the public 
is fundamentally a violation of the Brown Act. There's no way that a member of the public reading this notice could know that the, uh, that the slope regulations are going to be so fundamentally, would be so fundamentally. I also think there are significant CEQA issues. Uh, the staff report talks about um, the uh, fact that the general plan and its EIR covered everything. I don't think the general plan covered removing the restriction on development on slopes over 50 percent. So I, I, I think that there are some serious problems here, uh, but my basic problem is the, the Brown Act one that we're, we would be going forward with, a, with an ordinance that makes major changes to the zoning, to various zoning ordinance provisions without being clear about what those changes are. So I, 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 I could open the public hearing um, uh, and hear from the public. We could get a staff report. But I think there really are um, uh, Brown Act issues here that would, uh, and this is particularly the case because um, the, the, slope regula the way the slope regulations, as I understand it, are proposed to change, uh, it would essentially over turn and make moot uh, Lost City uh, uh, lost uh, regarding a development on Ocean Street Extension without any notice to the people in that area who uh, um, brought, that, brought that lawsuit. So I think it, there are really legal, uh, legal problems. I don't know whether staff wants to respond to those. Um, I'm happy to hear what staff has to say, but I really am basically uh, I, I really think this item should be continued for renoticing in a way that clarifies what's being proposed. Um, Hi, Chair. I, I can speak to that, Chair. Um, and I, I would agree that as far as the, the slope the slope discussion goes, uh, that could that word could have specifically been mentioned in the notice. However, we did include the specific section in that notice. Um, so we do feel that it's, it's covered from, from a legal standpoint. Um, and in terms of the, the slope discussion as well, um, the changes we're bringing forward, uh, a number of them are goals in the, in the general plan. So we do feel like uh, there, there, is, there is some reasoning for these to be included uh, as part of the cleanup items. Um, we have uh, Sam Hasher here as well, uh, our senior planner, who could also provide some more input on on why those are specifically cleanup items as well. If you need further comment on that, um, but if if you would like to move forward with the rest of the the presentation, uh, the rest of the the work outside of the slope, uh, we could also move forward with that too. It's not a it's not a pertinent item. So, uh, if that needs to be continued, that's certainly uh, up to you. From my perspective, I think it's very ironic where I'm told I can't submit in writing uh, items for public com uh, to the public conversation uh, correspondence agenda before a meeting uh, in writing uh, without violating the Brown Act. Uh, but somehow, it's adequate public notice to quote a code section, uh, assuming that members of the public would understand what that code section is. Um, I don't think that's the intent of the Brown Act uh, to, uh, in terms of providing adequate public notice. So uh, uh, if the commission is supportive and if staff is supportive, um, I'd be willing to uh, move forward with the rest of it if, if the, uh, the proposed changes to the slope regulations were continued uh, and we'd come back at a, uh, at a subsequent uh, meeting. Commissioner Conway? Chair, I appreciate your thoughtfulness on it. I'd like to receive a staff recommendation on the whole thing and have this conversation um, after we've heard the staff re uh, recommendation about uh, whether we would withhold the slope modification. But I'd, I'd like to hear the staff presentation. Any other commissioners? Getting a little late, but I'm willing to do that. Commissioner Conway, I mean Dawson. Yeah, I, I would just like to um, echo what 
Chair Schiffrin said, you know, I, I have experience with regulatory packages in, in Sacramento, and when the la language cleanup is used, that's usually specifically to add precision to an existing ordinance. So say you have a GPS boundary to something, you add some additional digits to the precision of that. This is, there, there's certainly with the slope, but I feel like there, there's some fundamental changes in the way that we do things that isn't just removing um, no longer valid parts of the ordinances. And so um, I also feel like there, this was not noticed properly for, for the public to actually understand that there were, are some substantive changes in here. So um, I, I would propose that we just continue, um, certainly the slope, but honestly, I think the whole thing. Um, this is Catherine Donovan, the senior planner with the Advanced Planning Division. And um, Matt did address the notice, but I also want to mention that um, we sent the notice to our city attorney for review, and um, he told us that it, since we had specifically entered the um, chapters that we were revising, that that, that was adequate notice. Unbelievable. Uh, any other commissioners uh, want to weigh in? Um, I don't know if anybody wants a motion to continue this or we've got a recommendation from Commissioner Conway to get a staff report. Commissioner Nielsen, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just would, I think it's appropriate for us to have a staff report on this. I don't think we should be doing anything before we have a staff report. If there's no objections, then let's have a staff report. Okay, let me share my screen with you. I apologize, my um, computer is a little slow here. or possibly a lot slow. Here we go. Can you hear me? My phone is making strange noises. Yes. Yeah. So we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Um, this is our cleanup ordinance amendment. Um, so why a cleanup ordinance? Uh, we do these ordinances periodically. Um, and unlike um, Commissioner Dawson, who was describing the definition in the, that the state uses for uh, cleanup, um, we include a variety of things in our cleanup ordinances. Um, and actually, a, a prime example happened earlier today when um, Chair Schiffman noted that there was not a definition for the affordable rent for moderate income households. That's the kind of thing that makes it into this ordinance. And I actually made a note of that and it will come to our next cleanup ordinance. Um, so in this ordinance in particular, um, we have um, a number of items, some of which will improve and streamline our development processes. Um, we also have uh, ordinances that clarify confusing or abbreviated language. We're removing redundant sections of, of ordinances, providing um, internal consistency in one area of the 
um, ordinance with another and also um, bringing it into consistency with state law. We're updating outdated descriptions, concepts, and regulations, um, and also addressing new uses, technology, and ways of life, um, and improving the ordinance to better meet the needs of the city's residents. Um, and so, let me, oh, sorry, this, So here are some examples of improving the process. Um, we currently require a design permit for any structure or addition, and we're proposing to um, remove that, to, to make an exception for structures that are additions that are less than 120 square feet. And we chose that number because that's the number if you have, um, if you're building a structure that's less than 120 square feet and does not have electricity or plumbing, um, it does not require a building permit. So it seems like a good threshold for um, not requiring a design permit. Um, we're also proposing to reduce the number of findings for design permits. We currently have 16 findings to make for design permits. And for each project that comes through, the planners have to describe why this pro how this project meets those standards. But typically, uh, communities have four or five um, design findings that, that need to be made. You can imagine this is um, three to four times the number that is, is normal there. Um, we're also removing the slope modification permit and using a combination of geotechnical reports and design permits um, instead. Okay, I'm sorry, this is going so slow. I'm going to... Catherine, do you need me to share from my computer? Yeah, I think so. I just, it's frozen for me. Let me see if I can stop sharing. I can't even stop sharing. Maybe thank you. I'm sorry, my computer is frozen at this point. Um, I'm going to have to, oh, oh, there we go. Okay, Matt, if you could um, pull that up for me, that would be great.
Yeah, this is the next slide. Okay. Um, we also have clarification examples. Um, they include um, for our outdoor storage display and sale of merchandise, we simply moved other similar activities, which was sort of in the middle of the list of things that you could do to the end of the list. Um, we also clarified what is included in the um, lot coverage cal calculation for large homes and single family areas. Um, and we moved all the sign definitions um, from the definition section of the code and from the downtown sign section of the code into the general definition in the sign ordinance. Next slide. Um, consistency examples include um, there is a list of public hearing requirements, um, what, what type of uh, projects need a public hearing, and there's also a table that shows um, the decision-making body with final authority for those projects. And we are updating those both to reflect the changes in um, that other changes that were made in the ordinance, but also because um, there were some areas where those two things were inconsistent with other sections of the code already. Um, we're also updating the density bonus section um, to the, conform to the requirements of state law, um, and that includes we currently require a pro forma um, for um, some inclusionary uh, requirements and the uh, state law, state density bonus law says um, that you cannot require a, um, a report that would not otherwise be provided by the developer. And um, so what we did was we said, uh, a pro forma or other reasonable documentation, which is the term of art that's used in the density bonus, state density bonus law. Another section in the, the density bonus um, law uh, uh, ordinance that we updated was um, there are times when there is not a specific, um, uh, an explicit, I should say, density in either the um, general plan or the zoning ordinance for a particular district. And so we have um, been using what we call an implied density, which is based on the development standards for the property. Um, and the way, the way we've been using it is when a developer comes in with a project, we calculate um, the density of that specific project. Um, and then base the density on the actual, base the density bonus on the actual density. Um, and then also uh, require that the average size of the units be, for the density bonus units be the same as the average size for the non-density bonus units. Next slide. And these are some examples of improvements that we're making with this ordinance. Um, we currently restrict the amount of open rooftop open space that can be counted toward uh, the usable open space calculation um, to 25%. And since if you actually have a usable rooftop garden, um, that that is really high quality open space, and so we're removing that 25 percent 
restriction. Um, we're also setting a limit on the amount of impervious surface allowed in the front setback. Um, we, we have a limit on the amount of uh, the, the percent that the driveway can cover, but this would um, complement that by allowing just 10% um, more for any other kind of you know, walkway or whatever, um, and, and leave 50% to be non-paved. Um, and another improvement is that we are expanding the closing time for cannabis retailers from 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. And this was a, along with a number of I, other items that went before council um, for direction last September. And at the time, we had said we would bring it back um, in the late spring, given our, our the schedule of what we had on our plate. And then... Uh, coronavirus interfered and um, delayed, and we're just bringing it back now. Next slide. Um, other things we're doing in this ordinance are, are updating things. Um, our home occupation regulations are uh, quite outdated. They're, they They predate people working from home and basically we're, we're talking about people doing things like you know crafts from their home. So we've um, updated that quite a bit, particularly uh, around um, the difference between working from home when you're actually a, an employee of a business and also um, where we would allow one employee at the home who does not live there, which is, is new. Um, and we would also, we are also um, increasing the number of trips that would be allowed um, because the, when the, the trips were originally set, that was um, pre-online ordering. Um, so that has changed the world quite a bit. Um, another example of updates are that we've added some new um, definitions, including a definition of e-bike of inoperable vehicle and of motor vehicle. The, the, the second, the last two are, are not new concepts, but they were never defined in our code before. Next slide. I'm sorry, you're probably seeing these slides a lot more quickly than I am. Um, uh, so I'm sorry if there's a long delay before I address what's on the screen. Um, Do you want me to cover this slide? There you have it, Catherine. I got it, thanks. That's okay. just finally coming up. Um, so since the packet was delivered to you, we have a couple of updates that we wanted to make. Um, in the staff report, um, we talked about the community meeting and said that there were no comments on this item, and that was actually incorrect. There were uh, a number of, of comments. They included um, reducing uh, suggestion to reduce the minimum lot size for R15 districts. Um, we have a large number of substandard lots and the suggestion was if we lowered the lot size that that would reduce the number of substandard lots in the city. Um, the, we also had a suggestion to change the large house definition to be based on the floor area ratio rather than the square footage. Um, and those two items we, we both we, we thought both of them had uh, a lot of merit, but we needed more time to consider the, the implications and to, to talk about how we would go about doing that before we brought them before uh, forward. So they didn't make it into this, um, this version or this, this ordinance. Um, a third comment was also that 
that relocation assistance discourages improvement. Um, and our city council has, has indicated that they strongly support relocation assistance. Um, so we did not make any changes based on, on that comment. And then the final comment was a suggestion to allow one employee for home occupation. And we all thought that was a good idea and it was pretty easy to do. So we included that in this, um, the, in this ordinance. Um, another comment, we received an email today um, after about 5.30 this evening, and that was too late for our admin staff to um, include it in the packet. Um, um, but I can give you a, a high-level summary of, of the content. Um, this was from Ellen Aldridge, um, and she was concerned about the notice not saying modifications to slope regulations. And, um, you know, as it was discussed, um, the, the, no the notice was general and included some things but did not include everything. Um, and we could have included that and perhaps should have and probably will for our city council. Um, notice. Um, she also desired uh, more rationale for the proposed changes, um, which we can discuss uh, in more detail. And she um, requested information on various on various changes, which um, I don't have the specific information about that. And she requested that we um, continue that item stating that it isn't urgent, um, although I would not say that it's urgent. We do have a couple of code cases that this item relates to, and I know of at least two people, who, two of our current planners, who've told me that they have development projects that um, could be affected by this. Um, but it, it's not, I, you know, it's nothing that a week, a, a, a one meeting delay or possibly two meeting delay would have a significant impact on. Um, and I believe that was it on that note, on that email. Um, and then finally, um, as I mentioned in the staff report at the, as we were getting ready to put the packet out, um, we realized that uh, someone noticed that there had that there had been changes in state regulations related to large family daycare centers, um, and um, it would it's a it's a relatively simple change. It, the, the changes that it, previously we had to follow the same we, for large family daycare centers we could require an administrative use permit, and the change is now that they need to be. Um, allowed by right in any district that allows housing. Um, and as you may know, we have, um, I think, nine districts that are residential districts, and then an, uh, uh, four or five other commercial districts that also allow residential. So it was just too many changes to include in this ordinance at that late date. Um, next slide. Um, and then um, after we had put out the packet, um, the planning, the director, uh, deputy director, and the principal planners and I had a Zoom conference about the slope, board, slope regulation and um, uh, came up with additional amendments or revisions to the amendments we'd already made um, and the revisions would um, comply with SB 330, which is the Housing Accountability Act. Um, they would clarify when a design permit is required. Um, and we transferred the findings from the slope permit 
split modification permit into the design permit because we had originally um, included a, a finding that we had written specifically for um, the slope regulations, but SB 330 does not allow any new um, subjective standards to be, or subjective findings to be included after January 1st of 2020. However, you can continue to use existing subjective standards. So we deleted the standard we had written for the ordinance and brought the old findings back. Um, we also um, updated the stormwater conditions slightly based on um, recommendations from our stormwater manager. Uh, we also further clarified projects that are exempt from a design permit, and we removed the unbuildable lot condition um, because there's a, a condition in the subdivision chapter that covers that, that issue. Next slide. Um, so I wrote, uh, I know this is a very long recommendation, but I wrote it out because it would include the, um, including the revisions related to large family daycare centers and the new revisions to the slope regulations provided on September 17th, 2020. Um, so if uh, you decide to delay the slope regulations, then we would leave that section out. We hope that we can go forward with the large family daycare center uh, changes because there's pretty, um, it's just bringing it into compliance with state law. We wouldn't be making any other changes. And, and I do um, just want to reiterate here, uh, if, if the planning commission chooses to move forward with uh, the recommendation or any portions of it, uh, we'll consider those comments and, and approve upon um, our public noticing for those for when those uh, recommended items go to council. And I'd be happy to take any questions. We, we talked about um, if there are a lot of questions about many different sections of the ordinance, how, how best we might address this. Um, but I don't know, um, I don't know how you would like to do this. We can bring up each ordinance and go through things one by one. We can bring up the um, summary sheet and look at individual sections, um, whatever, whatever you'd like to, whichever way you'd like to do it. Does that conclude the staff report? That concludes the staff report. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I guess uh, my approach would be to go around and have commissioners. I have lots of questions myself. I think there's a lot that's good here. Um, clarify, I think, or if I'm right, is the Planning Commission subject to the Brown Act? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Is the Planning Commission subject to the Brown Act? Yes. So is it sufficient just to clear up the noticing requirements at the council when they were not appropriate at the Planning Commission? This one well, according to, according to our city attorney, the noticing was, was fine. Um, if you would prefer to delay the public hearing and require re-noticing, we can do that. Um, given the length of the notice and the amount of time it takes to get in the paper, that would probably mean it would go in the second meeting of October. Well, I, I think, you know, that the commission does have the responsibility to follow the Brown Act and I respectfully disagree with the city attorney that mentioning a code section provides the public with proper notice of what the commission is going to be talking about. But that's 
um, up to the rest of the commission, or, or a majority of the commission anyway. And if, if we want to um, take questions, go through a normal procedure, uh, take questions, hear from the public, and then discuss what we're going to do, uh, that's fine by me. Does anybody want to do anything different? So why don't we start uh, with commissioner questions for staff. Um, do commissioners have questions? Who would like to start? Yes, Commissioner Conway. This is actually very minor in light of the whole thing. I just wanted clarification about the <clears throat> updates to the large family uh, daycare. Um, I was just a little confused, Catherine. Um, you're saying that they um, they came late, but you're proposing to include those cha those changes for consistency, and the way that you're proposing noticing them covered were covered there, going to the city council. Or could you clarify how how you're being handled? How you're handling? You know, those? you're right. That we we should bring those back later because they would not be covered in. Um, the, the, the notice. Okay. Um, so that's a piece that, so if, if we are pulling apart, um, we can, we, we could send a significant amount of this to council potentially, but um, we have, we, we may have some pieces that need revisiting. Is that an um, awkward or excessively expensive way to handle this? Um, In your opinion? You know, it's a little awkward, but it, I would mm -hmm. I would love to divide this up and be able to mm -hmm. take the easy steps forward. And if there are um, particularly the, the slopes and the family daycare um, mm -hmm. could come back, that would be fine. I mean, we, we got slope changes to you very late um, mm -hmm. and we're much happier with the end result, but we realized that you didn't have much time to look at it. Well, I'm just cognizant of the um, expense to the city, um, and um, I just I just wanted to know um, the impact of, of how we decide things. So I'd look for advice on that. But I would be if that isn't awkward, I would be comfortable with that. And thanks for clarifying that about childcare. I couldn't quite wrap my head around it, and I'd like to hear from other commissioners. Well, since nobody's popping up, I'll go through mine since I have a, a number of them. Uh, in terms of internal consistency, am I understanding correctly that the proposal is to reduce the public hearing requirements and changing the review bo uh, body uh, for major modifications to a project? Um, and uh, for a major modification, there would only be the requirement for a zoning uh, an administrative decision by the zoning administrator. Am I understanding that correctly? Um, let me. I, I should also admit that I did not make all of these changes myself. This was definitely a group effort, and I am I'm just the shepherd on some of these, so I need to look up some of the specifics. Well, again, one of the problems is the staff report doesn't have page numbers, so it's, you know, I could refer you to exactly where it is, but it take me an hour to find out. Or, I, actually, I found it, but I don't, it's, I don't Can know. Can you give me the code section? Second page um, of the staff report where it's under internal consistency, consistency with state regulations. Um, I can answer that for you, Chair Schifrin, if, if you want to. Sure. Um, and, and Sam uh, Hashard, our principal planner and current planning, can chime in if, if I'm getting any of this wrong, because I know she was working on a number of these things. But uh, that uh, change would occur if the original hearing or, or if the original decision-making body was the zoning administrator. Um, it would not occur if the original decision-making body was the planning commission. Then it would go back to the planning commission. Did I gather that correctly, Sam? That was my recollection. Yes, that's correct. So um, this really was a clean up item. Uh, the original code section required that um, 
I believe it required that all of them went to a public hearing. We really wanted to make sure that it went back to a public hearing if it was heard by it was heard if it was heard in the original permit was heard in a public hearing. But we didn't want to require every modification to go back to a public public hearing if it wasn't warranted. So, for a major modification of a project that was approved by the zoning administrator, it would what what the code said I think is that it would be approved by. The ZA administratively, and uh, it was unclear to me. One, does that mean it wouldn't be at one of the ZA's public hearings? And two, would that administrative approval be appealable? Um, well, so your the answer to your second question is that yes, the approval would be appealable. Um, uh, the administrative review would be appeal appealable. Um, and what was your first question? Whether it would be a public hearing at the ZA or whether somehow it would be some other administrative uh, action on his part or her part. Um, so we have we have two things here. We have minor modifications and we have major modifications. And it sounds like you're referring to the major modifications. I think to answer your question, Chair, um, yes, yes. If if this was approved by the ZA and was coming back due to a modification, uh, the, the streamlining in this would would then make that an administrative approval by the zoning administrator. That would not. So it would it would not be a public hearing, correct? How could there be public notice so someone could appeal it? Does that mean it's not appealable? Uh, that would mean that a major modification could be approved administratively with no uh, opportunity for the public to appeal it. That, I'm just trying to understand what the consequences of the proposed changes would be. Our administrative approvals are appealable, but you're correct that there is no public notice for that. How would anybody know that the approval has been had been given or the administrative action had been taken. Is there some requirement for publication of it or something that would allow the public to know about it? Sam, do we post those actions online? We have a list of the uh, permits that we um, have in process. Are my our major modifications one of those that we post online? Would be posted um, online, and then somebody would have 10 days to appeal it, or how would that I'm, process work? I'm asking Sam that question. I'm not sure if it is. We don't. We don't now post those online. But right now, um, major modifications all require public hearings, even if the original approval was made administratively. So, um, if the original approval was administratively the original permit was administratively approved and you wanted to do a major modification to that, it would now require a public hearing. We're proposing that it requires a public hearing if the original permit required a public hearing. But if the original permit didn't require a public hearing, then the major modification would also not require a public hearing. Okay, so there, we have permits that are approved administratively with no public notice. That's correct. Yes. Okay. I, uh, thank you for the clarification. Um, my next question has to do with calculate, calculating densities when none are in the code. And as I understand, staff report uh, is particularly true in the downtown um, that the uh, process that the staff has been following has been um, ha is now going to be codified in, in terms of. Uh, it's been explained several times by the planning director. I will not try to repeat it. I think I understand it, but um, am I understanding mm -hmm. that correctly? Yes. Yeah. Okay, there are a couple of changes in the ordinance, uh, the ADU ordinance, 
based on an HCD interpretation, and there's a letter from the HCD saying they agree with our uh, interpret our changes uh, that conform to their um, in, uh, their perspective. What legal authority does the HCD have to uh, require the city to follow their interpretations? Are they are they identified in state law as uh, having the ability to uh, require jurisdictions to conform to their com their interpretations? Well, they're generally the agency that um, implements land use um, and planning regulations. And um, this, this arose when um, there was a, we were bringing this, or, um, Sarah Noisy had updated our ordinance with the latest state regulation, and we were bringing it to the Coastal Commission, and there was a conflict between what, what the um, changes to the state regulations for ADU uh, for ADU said and what the Coastal Commission wanted us to do. And so um, HCD became the uh, spokesperson for the changes to the ADU regulations. And um, Sam became, or, uh, Sarah became the ping pong ball between the Coastal Commission and, the, and HCD. And, okay, um, I, I, and I, I understand the problem. There are a number of these laws that the Coastal Commission, the Coastal Act, uh, doesn't require that they be followed. Um, but what I'm really asking, I, I'm not so concerned about um, the, the change to allow larger ADUs based on the HDD interpretation, but I am concerned about the change that would eliminate all open space and landscaping requirements. Um, and in the ordinance, there are two, um, two sentences. One sentence says, you know, some kind of reasonable open space and landscaping should be provided. The second sentence says, um, and the, private, uh, the um, neighbor, neighbor privacy should be considered. I could see why the second sec section uh, sentence isn't really consistent with the state law, but I don't see why um, all open space and landscaping requirements have to be taken out. Um, and so I'm just wondering whether if the city decided that, well, we want to keep in the first sentence, um, is that, would that be considered a violation of state law? Or, you know, could, could uh, HCD say, no, you're not allowed to do that? Um, it's unclear what their, I know what their role is in the housing element um, and but I'm not, I'm not aware of what their role is as the implementer of the ADU, uh, ADU law, whether they can provide guidelines and um, suggestions or whether their word is essentially like the CEQA guidelines, their word is law. So do you have the answer to that, what their role is? So there is a uh, statement in the statute that uh, in the, some of the recent ADU statutes that speaks to HCD actually um, reviewing um, local jurisdictions ordinances for consistency with state law. Um, you know, Sarah Noisy is um, our specialist on that and she'll be on in just a second. She can speak to the uh, landscaping question specifically unless um, uh, Matt, it sounds like you know he may have something to add to that as well. Yeah, not not on the landscaping specifically. I think Sarah would have to address that. Um, but but I do know there there is quite a bit of communication between her and uh, HCD to conform to the requirements. Well. Yeah. My question is really a legal question, but I understand, you know, I'll wait for uh, uh, Sarah to get on the line. To yeah, we can jump back to that topic in, in just a minute if you don't mind, Chair Schifrin. Not at all. Um, I, uh, um, 
think the relocation assistance changes are really excellent and want to staff for including those. Um, my, my biggest, well, I'll leave the, um, I'll leave my slope regulation concerns for a moment. On page nine of the coastal zone ordinance, and this is a numbers, uh, under design permit standards, uh, while non-residential projects must be compatible with and not adversely affect or degrade the surrounding neighborhood, this isn't true for residential projects which, which need to only need to comply with objective standards. Um, couldn't some of those non-residential standards be converted? Is that going to be some of the, could that be looked at in, in, as part of the contract for uh, objective standards to uh, deal with those kinds of I issues? It just seems kind of arbitrary that a non-residential um, uh, project can't degrade or adver adversely affect the surrounding neighborhood, um, but a, uh, a residential project can. Um, I think somehow that, yeah. It makes sense to try to um, integrate those in some meaningful way. And we originally had it that just, it was just projects, development projects, but um, uh, that you're exactly right. It was the um, subjective standards issue, and so we divided it out. And uh, we will be doing our best with our with our objective standards. Um, process to um, include that kind of concept, but um, you know it will. It, it's not an easy thing to put in um, objective language. And looks like Sarah's here. Maybe she can address your ADU question. Sorry, I'm just tuning in. What is the question we're trying to answer? It's it's just really what regulatory role does HCD have in the implementation of the ADU uh, law? Because I'm, uh, I don't have a problem with the larger ADU fine, but I did, I was concerned with the uh, open space and landscaping requirements, which I'm now trying to find, um, because it seems to me that um, to, totally eliminate any concern about uh, open space and landscaping really uh, was not appropriate. And so mm -hmm. I, I, there were two sentences in the uh, existing code that I could find, um, and um, I was thinking that the, the uh, eliminating the second stand, uh, sentence, which had to do with uh, neighborhood, um, you know, neighborhood impacts, na uh, impact on neighbors. I could see that the ADU law wasn't really concerned about that, but having some um, uh, recognition of the desirability of open space as part of an ADU project uh, was seemed reasonable to me. So could you, do you remember what the code section is? I'm trying to find it here. You know what I'm talking um, about? I do, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, so, <laughs> oh yeah, thanks, Catherine, that's helpful. So to, um, to answer your first question, oh, sorry, go ahead, Catherine, what were you saying? I'm just saying it's on page 10 of the non-CC, uh, non-Coastal Commission ordinance. Okay. And I've, um, I've got the screen shared here. Yeah, okay. Okay. thank you for doing that. Okay, great. So um, to answer your first question about the specifically what's the role of HCD, they are the ones that determine whether an ordinance uh, complies with state law. And the, the statute, the government code section that we are implementing here contains language that states any ordinance that does not comply with this statute is invalid and unenforceable or words to that effect. So Sarah, I lost your audio. Did others lose Sarah's audio? I lost it. Yeah, I did too. Yeah. Sarah, we can't hear you. We can't hear you now. 
We lost your audio. So what Sarah was saying I is think a good reminder um, that the state code um, does indicate that if the ordinance is uh, found to be inconsistent, um, if our local ordinance is found to be inconsistent with state law, then the entire ordinance is nullified and we revert back to state law um, requirements itself. And so we do have a lot of things in here that are in addition to or expand upon state law. And so um, I, I think that's really the, the key uh, point to your question, Chair Schifrin, and uh, thanks, Sarah, for, for reminding us that. I, we might have your audio back. Let's see. Yeah. It, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear you. Yeah. Okay, so that was weird. I don't know what's going on. So um, answering your second question, one of the key pieces that's also in the state law um, is that this is a ministerial review. So ADUs cannot be subject to any sort of discretionary review um, anywhere outside of the coastal zone, anywhere in the state of California. Um, and it's debatable whether they can be subject to that within the coastal zone, but let's not go down that rabbit hole. Um, so... <laughs> The concern of the of HCD was that some of the standards, the way they were written in here, they were subjective. They were subjective to the point where um, we might be, you know, conditioning or denying a permit that really we are obligated to approve and issue. So, um, in the case of some of those privacy ones, I did go ahead and try to um, just write some objective standards of like what does privacy mean it means we're obscuring views it means we're including you know transom windows instead of you know just normal windows um i wasn't able to come up with anything that really got at this piece about open space and landscaping also because um this is this piece is also a bit more complicated now that adus are allowed on multi-family property so um the way that open space and landscaping might be described and we might write some code language for a single family situation might doesn't necessarily translate well to multifamily context. And given the limitations on what we are able to regulate in terms of the size, um, I couldn't really find a way to make this standard work in an objective way that would fit all the different contexts that it has to fit. So if I'm understanding what you're saying with number six, um, the, the concern is that even just to say the site, site plan shall provide open space uh, and landscaping that are useful for both the accessory unit and the principal single family um, dwelling just by itself would make it discretionary because somebody could determine what's useful and what's not useful? Right, they were concerned about that word useful and, and who, who decides what's useful. It just seems very unfortunate that we're not able to have any, um, that these units are not gonna be required to have any open space or landscape uh, landscaping requirements. I don't know whether it's possible to stick in something that would, you know, would be a performance standard so it wouldn't be subject to, um, to a discretionary action, but still recognize that it's desirable to have open space and landscaping in these developments. But I think I understand what the answer to my question is. So let me go to um, the slope regulation. Chair Schiff, um, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yes. This is the clerk. Uh, we'll need a motion to extend the meeting to end at a time certain past 11 o'clock. Our bylaws require our meeting adjourned at 11 unless you uh, entertain and pass a motion to adjourn at a time certain. I'll move. Yeah, um, I'll move that we go until 11:15. A second. A second. Uh, any discussion? I'm not going to do a roll call. All in, unless somebody votes no. All in favor? Aye. 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 No. Aye. The we really 
received today um, changes to what we had received previously on the, sto the slope regulations. And um, I really have not had that much of a chance to read them over, but it seemed to me that the, the rationale for the changes, if I understood the staff report, is that it, it, under SP 330, it really isn't appropriate to change standards that were in effect before the law passed uh, now that uh, after the law. Is that, am I understanding that uh, correctly, that the objective standards that were there before the law um, really are the ones that we, so that's, that's why all the relationship to the, some of the, the new language was put in. Um, right. I'm just trying to understand what's going on. Um, I, I don't, I have fundamental sort of policy problems with the proposed changes in terms of weakening the city's longstanding environmental commitments. Um, I think that the, the, some of the changes are, you know, uh, represent sort of bad public policy. But because I really think that the CEQA uh, uh, review was inadequate, given how significant some of these are, and uh, my concern with the noticing, um, if somebody would, uh, if a commissioner would be willing to make a motion to con continue the, s the proposed changes for the slope regulations and the family daycare yeah. homes uh, to a, a later meeting, um, that may save time, and maybe we would actually be able to get out of here by 11:15. So, if you're willing to make that motion? Commissioner Dawson. Yeah, I, I would go ahead and move that we continue um, the family daycare and the slope regulations to a future meeting. Is there a second? I see Commissioner uh, Maxwell raised his hand. Are you seconding it? Head, yes. Uh, is there discussion on the motion to continue these? Two uh, items sorry, I will second. To a subsequent meeting? So maybe we should have a roll call vote. Um, uh, all in favor of the, uh, let's have a roll call. Aye for support it, no for deny it. Commissioner Conway? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Selman? Aye. Maxwell? Aye. Schifrin? Aye. And um, I, re I just realized that after complaining about the process, uh, Ad nauseum, I screwed it up by not uh, allowing the, uh, not asking for public testimony after the staff report and our questions. So uh, I apologize to whoever is there from the public. Uh, we have uh, agreed to continue the slope regulations and the family daycare uh, item, but if there's anything on this item, if the person is still there that they want to speak to, they have. Uh, Three minutes, and I apologize for having to do that. I've asked them to unmute. So they may be on the line. Please identify yourself, and you have three minutes. Go ahead. We can't hear you. Caller, you're on the line. Caller, you're on the line. I'll be so happy when we're back at the chambers. <laughs> 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 oh, this is so trying. Was that the only person who uh, had their hand up to speak? 
Yes. And now they're gone. <laughs> and now they must have woken up and then bailed. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> okay. Um, so we're back to the rest of the uh, ordinance. Uh, there's nobody in the public who wants to speak. Um, so um, let's have discussion of the other uh, changes to the to the uh, to the ordinance. Yes, Commissioner Dawson. Yeah, I um I would just like to ask staff to consider in the future um, just being a little bit more selective about what they bundle. Um, having having a group to consider that has things related to signs or removing parts of the code that are no longer valid, along with things that are gonna fundamentally change kind of how Santa Cruz looks. Um, I, I think it's really challenging as a commissioner, and I can't imagine what it would be for the public to try to follow. So I, I really have a hard time uh, with this package generally, and I, I'm, I'm not gonna support it because I just feel like it, it's, even though there are parts within it that I agree with, I think just the approach is the wrong way to go. Thank you. Other commissioners uh, commenting on the ordinance, the, uh, the ordinance language before us, Commissioner Spellman. Yeah, I would just say, yeah, I think it is a challenging uh, approach, albeit as someone who uh, works with this code, you know, on a daily basis, it is refreshing to have what are considered minor revisions that uh, make the code much more legible and uh, transparent to the public and users is a very uh, useful process. It is a little awkward. There is a lot of stuff here if you want to dig in and, and really understand it. But I think it really is, aside from a slope issue, which we're not going to discuss, um, you know, sort of baby steps to make this a more user-friendly document. And uh, so I, I am in support of uh, the staff recommendation for the rest of the items that we are, that are before us tonight. And I'm willing to, to make a motion to approve those and send them on to the council. Is there a second to the motion? I will I'll second. second. Oh, go ahead, Christian. Okay. <laughs> Um, discussion on the motion. Any uh, other commissioners want to weigh in? I'm kind of mixed between uh, Commissioner Dawson and Commissioner Spellman. Uh, overall, I don't have big problems with it. I think there, it, there are lots of improvements. I do some things differently. Um, the, the, uh, I have problems with having districts that don't have density calculations in them. I wish we didn't have to live with implied densities and we could uh, let the public know what the uh, total densities might be, but uh, I know that's a losing battle at this point. I would suggest in terms of the public noticing um, that rather than sticking all of this, uh, all of the changes in one uh, paragraph, uh, it might be more helpful to the public to sort of break them out to say there are going to be changes to the tentative subdivision map, to use permits, design permits, and so it's not so um, uh, overwhelming to, to sort of read through a bunch of numbers, and um, it just makes it more difficult, I think, for the public to have any sense of what's being proposed. Um, and then maybe having the staff report that would really deal with them um, on a you know, uh, chapter-by-chapter -chapter basis, I think would be helpful in, you know, in having the members of the public be able to understand uh, what's being done. In terms of the, the, the changes, um, I've raised some of my concerns. My, work, my biggest concerns are with the slope regulations, which I'm, you know, I appreciate. Um, being continued. So uh, I, I'm 
willing to support the motion. Um, I think overall it's, uh, it's, 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 it's helpful. Um, it's not exactly what I would like by any means, but many of the things are really what's being required by state law. And, uh, I can you know, I can understand that the city's discretion is ever more reduced. Are there other um, commissioners who would like to comment on the ordinate, uh, the motion on the floor? Do we have a roll call vote? Uh, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Dawson. No. Greenberg. I'll take that as an aye, even though I couldn't hear it. Aye. Sorry. Um, Nielsen? Aye. Selman? Aye. Maxwell? Aye. Giffrin? Aye. The motion passes six to one. Um, we're now at information. Are there any information items? <clears throat> this is usually when the plan director tells us what's coming up next. Yes, thank you. Um, Chair Schifrin and commissioners, um, we are expecting that the Economic Development Department will have a presentation for you and for your consideration regarding the work plan and the associated EIR at your meeting on October 1st. And then um, uh, later in October, we are currently um, anticipating on the 15th, we had um, one item that was continued today, um, the um, Section 8 uh, items. So that could be back on the 15th if the subcommittee is ready to present. And then we're also expecting the Housing Matters uh, project. It's 120 um, uh, single room occupancy, uh, small units at um, the Coral Street site uh, on the Housing Matters campus. Um, so that'll be in front of you likely on the 15th as well. And um, there, there may be some other things that become ready. We'll uh, take another look at the, um, the uh, slope uh, items as well and re-notice those as well as the, um, the um, large family daycare. So that may uh, be back for back in front of you on the 15th, or it could get pushed out further as well. Um, but those are the things that are um, up in the immediate future. Okay. Are there any subcommittee or advisory body reports? I guess I should report that the technical advisory committee on the uh, coastal resilience project is going to be meeting sometime soon, and it sounds like they're getting close to finishing up uh, with their recommendations. And, I'm lost the specifics. So, if any of our, if any of anybody from staff can can let us uh, has any further information, hopefully after that meeting, um, I'll be able to give a more substantive report. Um, items referred to future agendas. We've heard from the uh, from the planning director. Does anybody else have any items they'd like to have on our future ad agenda? Okay, seeing now, thank you all for your perseverance uh, and a, a long meeting, and we're adjourned. So stay healthy. Goodbye.